She knew that he was up to something, but no one listened. A few hours later, she was brutally murdered. The 25th of January, 2023 gave the start to what has been dubbed South Carolina's trial of the century. Family mysteries, fraud, embezzlement, and murder are just some of the things that have been revealed in the ongoing Murdaugh trials. And there is even more left to uncover. Alex Murdaugh was born into South Carolina's law dynasty. His family's law firm dated back to 1910, with each generation of Murdaugh men becoming lawyers and taking the places of their elders. The law was deeply ingrained into his childhood, mentality, and way of life, or at least that's how it seemed on the surface. But what lay beyond Murdaugh's family man demeanor was beyond what anyone could have imagined. Trouble seemed to follow Alex. Just two years prior to the tragedy surrounding his family, his son, Paul Murdaugh, was involved in a boating accident that resulted in the death of 19-year-old Mallory Beach. Paul seemed to have a bit of an addictive personality just like his father. And in a drunken stupor, after a night of partying, he decided to operate his father's boat. Paul's incident cast a shadow over the Murdaugh family. They hated Paul Murdaugh, and they had anger in their heart. After all, they were well-known members of their community, and the law firm had been an integral part of their district's justice system for many years. But what Paul did would fade in comparison to what happened on the night of the 7th of June, 2021. Curious? At the Decoder, we put together case files from all available sources in order to present you with the most truthful version of events. Your support keeps us going, so make sure that you hit the like button and watch the rest of our videos. On the evening of the 7th of June, 2021, Paul Murdaugh was attending to Moselle, the 1,700-acre property that Alex said was his son's biggest passion. That fateful night, his father was to decide that young Paul was never to leave that place again. Paul and his father were driving around the property at around 7 p.m., looking at the trees they had planted. At 7.38 p.m., Paul took a Snapchat video of him and Alex laughing at some crooked trees on the property. <laughs> a seemingly innocent gesture, which he thought would make a fun memory of time spent with his father. Later, however, it would end up being used as evidence, placing Murdaugh at the scene of a horrendous crime. They arrived back at the main house at around 8 p.m., where they had dinner with an uneasy Maggie Murdaugh. Murdaugh's estranged wife had been hesitant to go to the property that night, having texted a friend about Alex's fishy behavior and her suspicion that he was up to something. At 8.22 p.m., three different apps on Paul's phone place him at the dog's kennel on the property, the same spot where the shootings were about to take place. Paul was texting his friends around that same time and tending to the dogs. In the meantime, Maggie and Alex were talking by the truck, or as evidence suggests, having one final argument. Murdaugh's anxiety was ramping up as the perfect opportunity for his plan was drawing nearer. At 8.44 p.m., Paul made another Snapchat video in which everyone's voices can be heard, cementing Alex's presence at the scene of the crime. Hey, he's got a bird in his mouth! Bubba! Hey, Bubba. It's a guinea! This is a chicken. Come here, Bubba! Come here, Cash. Come here, Bubba! Cash! Quit! In the meantime, Alex equipped himself with a blue raincoat, which would protect his clothes from any blood and his guns from any rain. It is believed that Alex later changed into a new set of clothes. As Paul looked down at his phone, his father walked up to him and shot him in the chest. He then came closer and shot him in the head. Maggie entered survival mode and tried to make a run for it as Alex grabbed his second gun and shot her five times. The bloody, vile scene of the Murdaugh family murders is now set. Paul is lying face down with his brains blown out by the second close-range shot. Maggie, who had tried to run, is also face down, having been hit in the back of the head. 
Alex took a look at his work and then proceeded to wash off his blue jacket, leaving behind puddles of blood mixed with water. At 8.55 p.m., Maggie's phone was activated in spite of her death. This was one of Alex's slip-ups, who had taken her phone and accidentally turned it on. He grabbed the car keys from Paul's pocket, leaving a blood stain inside. By 8.58 p.m., Alex had arrived back at the main house. By 9.02 p.m., Alex had walked 283 steps, pacing anxiously back and forth as he tried to calm himself down. He made a call and texted his wife's phone, two actions which would later make up part of his alibi. He then dropped Maggie's phone on the side of the road as he drove away from the family property. Alex then drove to his mother's home where he stayed for 20 minutes. He told his mother's carer, however, to say he spent 40 minutes there instead, since if that were true, it would have been impossible to place Murdaugh at the crime scene. Murdaugh got back to Moselle at around 10 p.m., and at 10.07, he made the 911 call announcing Paul and Maggie's deaths. Authorities arrived at the crime scene at 10.26 p.m. Following the authorities' assessment of the crime scene, Alex was asked for an interview by one of the officers. The following analysis looks into Murdaugh's body language and behavior during this interview. Watch out for what he is saying, and even more importantly, watch for the things he chooses not to say. And a good phone number for you. 803-942-1223. Right off the bat, we can notice Murdaugh's sniffling getting increasingly louder as the officer starts asking questions. He wants his emotional response to be noticed, from his voice occasionally cracking to his sniffling and constant blinking. He wants to show that he has been crying. And sir, what was your name? Yeah, Danny Henderson. Okay. All right. Murdaugh stares blankly into space. There's no way to tell whether he is doing this on purpose or not, but we know that he noticed and directly looked into the camera as it was turned on. So, there's a possibility that Murdaugh is aiming to appear more distraught or dissociated than he actually is. And, you know, I knew something was bad. I ran out. I knew it was really bad. <laughs> my, my boy over there, I could see. As the officer apologizes for having to interview Murdaugh right after the discovery of his deceased family, Murdaugh enthusiastically says, don't worry, and proceeds to tell his point of view. Murdaugh launches into his story, taking care to heighten the tremor and effect in his voice in the process, all without actually shedding a single tear. <laughs> And I could see his brain on his... <laughs> Murdaugh's breakdown at this point in the interview seems genuine. He is speaking about his son, who is believed to have been more of a collateral victim in Murdaugh's crime, his estranged wife being the main target. However, Murdaugh's return to a composed state is uncanny for someone who has just found their murdered son and wife, as is his ability to offer details. Um, then I went to my wife, and I, I mean, I could see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> did you touch Maggie at all? I did. I touched them both. Okay. I tried to take. I mean, I try to do it as limited as possible, mm -hmm. but I, I try to take their pulse on both of them. <coughs> Here, we can notice Murdaugh's lesser reaction to his wife's death, which highly contrasts his previous reaction to finding his son's body. 
had Maggie and Paul been arguing over anything? No. What was their relationship like? Wonderful. Wonderful. How about yours and Maggie's? Wonderful. I mean, I'm sure we had little things here and there, but we had a wonderful marriage, mm -hmm. wonderful relationship. <laughs> Further to his previous reaction, we can notice Murdaugh hesitate right after he says that his relationship with Maggie, his estranged wife, was wonderful. He then admitted that they had had their issues. But even that is an understatement of the things that have been going wrong in their marriage. In hindsight, it is clear that Murdaugh was playing up his relationship with Maggie, who we know was hesitant to see him in order to ramp up his performance. In reality, Maggie had been living separately from Alex and had been reluctant to come see him on the property that night. In yours and Paul's relationship? As good as it could be. How old was Paul? 22. Okay. As the now hesitant officer keeps nodding his head at Murdaugh's claims regarding his relationship with his wife, we see Alex look at the officer from under a furrowed brow. The officer does not make eye contact, but Murdaugh continues looking. This suggests that Murdaugh wants to assure the officer that he is telling the truth by initiating eye contact. Moreover, as the officer moves on with his questions, we can see Murdaugh still staring at him, expressionlessly assessing him, making us wonder, did Murdaugh know he was being treated as a suspect? It is likely that he did not, or not at this point in the investigation. What is clear from Murdaugh's behavior during the interview is that he is anxious, and that his anxiety is heightened whenever he is required to answer questions about that night. Has he received any direct threats related to the boat accident? Oh, yes. All the time he Re gets threats. Recently? Um, yes, sir. I mean, he gets them all the time. Okay. He gets them all the time. <clears throat> Once again, we can notice Murdaugh looking at the officer for a prolonged period after offering an answer. This pattern of behavior suggests that Murdaugh is assessing the officer's reaction for clues as to whether he's being believed or not. So is there anybody that you can think of that we need to talk to tonight? Is there a name that comes to mind? I mean, I can't tell you anybody that I'm overly suspicious of off the top of my head okay. you know um, I mean this is such a stupid thing I'm even embarrassed to say it but it just didn't make any sense I just hired a guy out here mm -hmm. and he really he wasn't cutting the mustard but I hadn't told him this yet Murda is once again constantly looking at the officer to gauge his reaction as he proceeds to list the people he is suspicious of, right after saying there is no one he's overly suspicious of. As he continues cushioning his following list with remarks of how stupid his suggestions are, we can notice the officer just nodding along, probably knowing that Murda had prepared this list before he was asked. He killed the sunflower seeds in our dove field just recently, which is why Paul was here doing this. He told Paul a story the other day about how when he was in high school, he got in a fight with some black guys. And the FBI undercover team observed him fighting those guys and put him on an undercover team with three Navy SEALs. And that their job was to kill radical black panthers. And they did that from Myrtle Beach to Savannah. Now, I really don't think this guy, you know, mm -hmm. is probably the person, but that's just so freaking. Yeah, that's kind of far-fetched story. That's weird, but he was off today. Okay. He took his daddy to the doctor. What's his name? C.B. Rowe. Murdaugh proceeds to disclose the story of the man he had hired to work on his grounds, who he claims could have a history of working with Navy SEALs for the government. This story had clearly been prepared for this moment. Murdaugh is able to give details regarding a man he barely knows, which especially in his supposedly distraught condition is highly unusual. Do y'all store any weapons out here? 
Um, we don't store them, but they're, you know, they're frequently out here. Mm -hmm. I need to find out if there were any out here because I know there was a shotgun. There was a 12 gauge shotgun out here. Uh, <coughs> I'll have to find out exactly when that was. I think it got put up, but I'm not positive. What did that shotgun look like? Uh, it was a camouflage. Um, I, I want to say it was a Benelli or maybe a Beretta. I can't remember which brand it is. Murdaugh is able to give extensive, detailed descriptions of one of the guns used in the killings, which he suggests was not stored on the property, but that could have been around at the time of the murders. Once again, offering this level of detail and making up potential reasons why the shotgun would have been on the property, even though it is not normally stored there, confirm Murdaugh with an uncanny behavior considering his situation. But I don't think it was out here. Okay recently but I'm not positive Murdaugh adds that he does not think the shotgun was there but that he's not sure of that all the while staring at the officer engaging his reactions in the same manner as before Murdaugh is saying anything and everything that could potentially cover him in case details which question his testimony come out this aspect of wanting to constantly reassure the officer with regard to what he does and does not know for sure is a marker of anxiety in Murdaugh. He is trying to cover everything that an innocent party would not know, and in his case, this is proving difficult at times. What did you do today? Were you at the office or? No, nope, I was home. I came home. Paul and I messed around. I, I, uh, I was up at the house. I, Laid down, took a nap on the couch, probably, I don't know, 25, 30 minutes. I got up, I called Maggie, didn't get an answer, and I left to go to my mom's. She had said she might ride with me, but she normally doesn't when I go over there. When asked about his day, Murdaugh did not spend a single moment thinking about what he had done. He immediately started listing the events of his day in detail, which suggests that he had planned his answer. In fact, it is almost as if he had scripted his day before it had even started. What's another number in case I can't get you on your cell? I don't have a house phone. Okay. Um, my office number. I can give you my brother's cell phones. As the officer announces they will have more questions and Murdaugh states his availability, we can notice him staring down at the officer's paperwork. It is no surprise that Murdaugh would want to know what was going on behind the scenes at this point in the investigation and whether he was being considered a suspect or not. Everyone reacts differently to shock, and whether someone cries is rarely an indicator of whether they are faking emotion or not. But in Murdaugh's case, what we can definitely observe as suspicious are his multiple switches between a very composed and articulate state to sobbing, or the other way around. This kind of emotional switch is highly uncanny, and combined with Murdaugh's ability to offer detailed answers to the officer's specific questions in spite of his supposed mental state is strange, to say the least. Moreover, faking emotion takes effort and we can observe Murdaugh simply dropping his sobbing after he laments Paul, and once again toward the end of the interview. Amongst the mountains of evidence that authorities claim they have collected against Murdaugh are the blue jacket Alex wore on the night of the murders, which is full of gunshot residue. Bullet casings and empty ammunition boxes matching the weapons used in the murders were also found on the Murdaugh property. Curiously enough, in completely different places from where the murders had taken place. Moreover, the evidence recorded on Paul's cell phone, such as the video of him and his father earlier on the evening of the 7th, as well as a video of one of their dogs placing Alex at the scene around the time of the murders, were found to contradict some of Murdaugh's earlier claims and alibi. But the question on everyone's minds, even on the minds of those suspicious of Alex, is why? Why would he kill his son and his wife? 
The answer to this question is almost more disturbing than the murders themselves. It has been revealed that Alex Murdaugh had been embezzling funds from his family's law firm for years. So it is believed that he took the lives of Paul and Maggie in an attempt to garner sympathy from the public and direct attention away from his scandal coming out. In fact, it was revealed that Murdaugh had been approached by the CFO of his law firm about missing money on the very morning of the murders. But in September 2021, Alex was confronted by members of the law firm over $1 million of funds which had gone missing. The very next day after this confrontation, Alex Murdaugh was shot in the head whilst changing a tire. His wounds, however, were superficial. After recovering from his shooting, Murdaugh bought himself some more time by entering rehab. As more information surrounding Alex's embezzlement started coming to light, Murdaugh decided to resign from his family's law firm, and his lawyer's license was later revoked by authorities. On the 15th of September 2021, yet another shocking discovery was made in the Murdaugh case, once again evidencing Alex's cunning, cold nature. It was revealed that Alex had hired a hitman to shoot him, by the name of Curtis Edward Smith, in order for his surviving son, Buster, to receive $10 million in life insurance. Murdaugh himself provided Smith with a weapon and directed him to shoot him in the head. It was only after multiple other indictments, including misappropriation of funds and embezzlement, that Murdaugh was charged with the murders of his wife and son. Alex Murdaugh is currently undergoing trial and is pleading not guilty on all charges regarding the events on the 7th of June, 2021. Did this video answer your questions about the Murdaugh case? What did you think of Alex's behavior during the interrogation? Let us know what you think in the comments below. The man accused of killing and then his parents. Law enforcement officials showing a meat grinder and gas can were found in the trunk of what they say is Guy's car. Guy is a college student in Louisiana. The Knox County Sheriff's Office called the crime scene gruesome. It would be described as horrific, uh, a very gruesome crime scene. What investigators found inside has been dubbed by the state as a diabolical stew. Knoxville, Tennessee, November 2016. A loving family spends a peaceful Thanksgiving together with no idea of the horror to come. Joel and Lisa Guy were the loves of each other's lives. Described by those around them as true soulmates, the pair had been happily married for over 30 years. They invited their children to celebrate Thanksgiving in their family home, the same home that two days later would be described by police as a house of horrors. Scattered limbs, the stench of chemicals, and a head found boiling in a pot on the stovetop. This is the horrible story of Joel and Lisa Guy's awful demise. Joel Guy was a pipeline engineer born in 1955. He already had three daughters from a previous relationship when he met the love of his life, Lisa. Joel and Lisa went on to have a son together, named Joel after his father. Joel Michael Jr., as he was known, was born in 1988 and was the couple's only child together. Yet Joel Sr. and Lisa remained close to Joel Sr.'s three daughters, with one of them describing Lisa as a loving mother to them all. Now, uh, Lisa was not your mother, is that correct? Correct. Can you tell the jury uh, when uh when you met Lisa and how, how that came about? Um, Lisa, when Michelle and I uh, were three, they met and she's been like a second mother to us since before I can remember. <laughs> After 31 happy years of marriage, Joel Sr. had made retirement plans and was selling their house in Knoxville, Tennessee. Joel and Lisa were looking forward to being able to spend more time with each other in retirement. They had bought a house in Sir Goinesville, Tennessee where they planned to live out their retirement. This was to be Lisa and Joel's last Thanksgiving in their Knoxville family home before their move. Are you aware of Lisa's plans to retire? Uh, yes, she was excited about retiring and just spending her time. They were madly in love, so just spending time with each other. Okay. It would be a celebration of their life together as they look forward to a new chapter.
but this new chapter would never arrive. Fast forward to Thursday, November 24th, 2016, Thanksgiving Day. The couple invited Joel Sr.'s three daughters and their children, along with their son, Joel Jr., to celebrate Thanksgiving with them. Joel Jr. was normally reclusive and quiet, but Michelle Tyler, his half-sister, suggests that on this occasion, he was behaving unusually. Michelle states that Joel Jr. made more of an effort with his half-sister's children that Thanksgiving, something he had never done before. Perhaps there was something special about this Thanksgiving, she thought, as the last in the family home. This day was a little different. It's, it was always more, the typical time with Dad and Lisa was more laughing and banter, but if Joel Michael Jr. was there, he wasn't ever hanging with us doing that banter. He would be in his room. And uh, at some point, did he interact, though, with your children? The Thanksgiving was different. The um, Thanksgiving was completely different. The moment that I um, arrived, Joel Michael Jr. was um, talking to us. And so and ta he had never, I I'm not sure Joel Michael Jr. knew my kids' names. And so for him to t talk to them was, was odd. She had no idea it would be their last Thanksgiving as a family at all. After the Thanksgiving celebrations were over, Joel Sr.'s three daughters left with their children, and Joel Sr. and Lisa Guy remained in the house with their son, Joel Jr. Joel Jr. had his own apartment in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, but remained with his parents after the holiday in their Knoxville home, where he had his own bedroom. Joel had been a student at Louisiana State University for several years. Though he had wanted to be a plastic surgeon, Joel dropped out of college in 2015 and had not had a job since. He was reliant on his parents and financially insecure. On the afternoon of Saturday, 26 November 2016, two days after Thanksgiving, Lisa Guy went out shopping for groceries at their local Walmart. At 3 p.m. the same day, her son, Joel Jr., was seen shopping in the same Walmart, buying bandages and chemicals. The next day, Sunday, November 27, 2016, Joel Jr. left the Knoxville house to seek medical aid for cuts he had sustained on his hand, driving back to Baton Rouge to be seen at the student clinic. On their own, neither action was suspicious. But on Monday, November 28, Lisa Guy failed to show up for work. Her boss, Jennifer White, had begun to worry. The company Lisa worked for was throwing her a retirement party, and she was missing it. She wasn't answering her home phone nor her mobile. Worried for Lisa's safety, Jennifer placed a call to 911, asking for Knox County police officers to do a welfare check on the Guy family. Uh, yes, I have an employee that um, has not reported for work today and highly unlike her. I've tried calling her home number, I've tried calling cell phone and can't get a hold of her. What can we do about that? Can somebody go by and check on them? Yeah, do you know her address? I do, I do. It, it is Golden View Lane. Okay. And what is your name, ma'am? My name is Jennifer Whited, W-H-I-T-E-D. And what company are you with? Jacobs Engineering. Okay, what's the employee's name? Lisa Guy, G-U-Y. Her husband's name is Joel, J-O-E-L. Should he be there too? Does he live with her? Yes, he does. And they do have a, a dog named Jake. I think he's a big baby. Okay. How old is he, do you know? She is in her, I think, late 50s. Do you know if she has any medical issues? No. I mean, she has high blood pressure, but that's all. That's all that I know of. Okay. Yeah, I know that their house is for sale, and they are moving, and she is leaving our company, but that's supposed to be Friday, and this definitely isn't like her just not to show up. Okay. Uh, I'll send a call over to officers, have them swing by and check 
Connor. Uh, and if anything changes before then, just give us a call back here, okay? At the same number? Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. Bye -bye. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. The officer undertaking the welfare check was Stephen Ballard, who went up to the guy's family home and rang the doorbell, but did not receive a response. He went around to the back of the house, but realized the gate was locked and didn't take any further action. But Lisa's boss remained concerned. An hour or two later, she called 911 a second time to ask for another welfare check. Detective Stephen Ballard went a second time to the house, this time with Detective Jeremy McCord. Looking through the window, they saw groceries, including perishable items such as milk and bacon, scattered all over the floor, and even though the house was for sale, there was no real estate agent lock on the door. They also noted that the back doorknob was missing. Ballard and McCord eventually gained access through the garage door. As they entered, they felt an intense heat. This was the first chilling sign of the horror that lay within. There were three cases of beer, perishables, there was uh, breakfast meat, stuff like that in bags that you, you could just see sitting there. And then immediately to the right is a formal dining room that had a, a large amount of uh, long guns laying there. Um, I think there was a red velvet cake at the end of the table. Uh, it's just stuck out. And so take, taking into account everything you've witnessed thus far, uh, the circumstances mm -hmm. present outside as well as what you observed inside, uh, how are you feeling at this point? It's terrifying because you don't know if somebody needs some help. I mean, it's just an odd situation. There's nothing downstairs that I'm observing that, that makes sense to me. You know what I'm saying? I mean, we're, we go through houses and we clear houses regularly. And most of the time, if you, if you encounter something, you kind of know right when you get in. This was a, a very different situation because once we get upstairs, it's like the world does a 180. Okay. Everything gets turned upside down. Inside the house, there were guns lined up on the dining room table. The smell of chemicals in the house was so strong that Ballard said his forehead was tingling in the toxic air. I actually feel a tingling on my forehead from the time that I entered the home. Um, as we continue on and start up the steps, the, the heat is more intense. It's, it seems to be getting hotter. Disturbed by these signs, they feared the worst. And upstairs, their fears were confirmed. The officers found a horrifying sight. A pair of human hands lying at the end of the hallway. I see a, a human hand. It was lying in an upright position with another human hand that was closed fist behind it. And downstairs, something even worse waited in the kitchen. The officers had entered a true horror show. Realizing they could not proceed without backup, they left the property. There was no one physically present in the house. No one alive. Backup was soon called, and forensic investigators arrived at the scene. On entering the house, they saw a large stockpot sat on the stovetop, which was hot. The forensics team also found reddish-brown stains up the stairs, on the walls, and on the banister. But the most grisly evidence of all was found in the bathroom. In addition to a weapon in the bathroom sink, they found two blue tubs that contained liquid and pieces of flesh. Nearly every room of the home was filled with evidence. Chemicals and weapons lay about the house and blood was found everywhere. But the occasional third resident, their son, Joel Jr., was nowhere to be found in the house. He was still alive. The police placed Joel Jr. under surveillance. As the only survivor, he became the only suspect and was apprehended on Tuesday, November 29, 2016 in Baton Rouge. A meat grinder was found in the trunk of his car. So what happened to Lisa and Joel Guy Sr.? It was clear they had been killed and their own son was the number one suspect. But why? In a backpack inside the house, officers found a startling piece of evidence. A black notebook used by Joel Jr. This notebook was the key to the deaths of Lisa and Joel Guy Sr. 
In fact, he'd written checklists detailing equipment he needed and steps he would have to take in order to kill his parents. Minimize things I touch throughout visit. Wear gloves and socks to prevent fingerprints and footprints. Drop something down the garbage disposal to break it. Get him on the ground fixing it. Clean up mess from him before she gets home. Bring blender and food grinder. Grind meat. The notebook, nicknamed the Book of Premeditation, showed that Joel Jr. had been planning this murder for days, if not weeks. As early as November 7th, nearly 20 days before the murders, CCTV footage shows Joel Jr. shopping for items he would later use for the murders, such as hydrogen peroxide. This is video of the male subject entering our grocery vestibule on November 26, 2016 at 3.26 p.m. His internet history similarly shows searches for different chemicals, such as sodium percarbonate, the active ingredient in OxyClean. Joel's plan was to end the lives of both of his parents and make it look like his father had done it. Joel Jr. planned to clean the crime scene and partially burn the house in an attempt to destroy evidence. He also wrote notes about the temperature of the house, stating that he would turn the thermostat up as high as it would go to further remove any evidence of his heinous crimes. As these pieces of evidence were revealed, the timeline of events began to become clear. And here's one from November 26, 2016 at 1218, uh, 18 minutes after noon at the 10,900 Parkside Drive Walmart, um, detailing uh, the items purchased or uh, consistent with what was uh, observed and, uh, and documented at the Golden View address in the foyer. On Saturday, November 26th, Lisa Guy went shopping. Left at home with his father, Joel Jr. attacked Joel Sr. in the upstairs exercise room. Police officers noted that the room was a mess, suggesting Joel Sr. fought for his life, but his son overpowered him and attacked him with a knife over 40 times. Lisa Guy arrived home just after midday. She walked into the house carrying the groceries she had just bought with no idea of the horror she was returning to. Perhaps she heard a sound from upstairs or saw some signs of her son's violent turn. She dropped the groceries all over the floor and ran upstairs. But she was too late to save her husband. Instead, her son attacked and killed her. She sustained at least 31 stab wounds. Joel placed his mother's head in a stockpot and set it on the stove, turning the stockpot on so his mother's head would boil. Having obtained a deep cut on his left thumb during the attack on his father, Joel Jr. left the scene to go to Walmart, where he was seen at 3.30 p.m. buying bandages, ointment, and more chemicals. It had been just over three hours since Lisa Guy was in Walmart buying groceries for the family. Now, Joel Jr. was shopping in the same Walmart, and both his mother and father were dead. Tragically, upon hearing the news that her daughter had been murdered, Lisa Guy's elderly mother collapsed and was taken to the hospital. She died the day before her daughter's funeral. Lisa's brother stated in court that his mom was heartbroken. But to find out your daughter was murdered by your own grandchild was heartbreaking. My mother died. There were three deaths on your hand, on Joe Michael Guy Jr.'s hands. On that day, I lost my family. My mother is gone, my sister is gone. The world has forever changed. The impact of this crime is notorious. My grandchildren's grandchildren will be able to read about this horrible, disgusting crime. We will never, ever be the same. The evidence stacked up against Joel Jr. as the case came to trial, yet he pleaded not guilty. Evidence from family and from Joel Jr.'s notebook showed that his motive was financial. Joel Guy Jr. had been financially supported by his parents for his whole life, with Lisa working tirelessly in order to give the majority of her paychecks to her son. Yet as they were nearing their retirement, the couple decided it was time for their 28-year-old son to stand on his own two feet and planned to cut him off financially. 
Joel Jr. had guessed what was happening and was not happy. Realizing that his parents would no longer support him, Joel hatched a plan. He thought that if both of his parents were dead, he would be able to access their $500,000 life insurance policy. On top of this, Joel Jr. would have access to his parents' other assets, such as their cars and their boat. For most of us, hurting any of our family members is inconceivable. But Joel Jr. not only killed the two people who loved and supported him the most, but he did it for money. Joel Sr.'s family members took to the stand to confirm he had been planning to cut his son off financially. Joel Sr. had been planning to tell Joel Jr. that coming Christmas, which the family would have celebrated in their new Segoinsville home, had their lives not been cut tragically short. Well, the week before, they were at the house, and we were talking about what they were going to do, and they said that they were going to wait till Christmas to talk to Joel Michael, that they were going to have to have him to start paying his bills and stuff. And this was a close family. They like to talk. And uh, they discussed these plans. And you, uh, you just can bet that Lisa Guy, who was Mr. Uh, Joel Guy Jr.'s uh, biggest fan, his enabler, his supporter, you know that she told him. She had to tell him in advance what, was, what he was in for, what was coming up for him. You know that happened. If they're talking about it with Michelle and Angela and Joel Sr.'s sisters in October and November, you know that the defendant knew about it and you know that his mother told him. So he knew what was coming. And he's smart. He's smart enough to know that uh, once his mom retires, once she quits her job, that insurance money's gone. He isn't getting that. He's not getting that. And, uh, and he's not used to supporting himself. He's used to having the support and uh, care uh, from his mother, primarily, taking care of his needs, providing him with an apartment, with utilities, with a car, gas money, paying his bills, his tuition, paying for his books, paying for everything. He's used to having her pay for everything. And he wasn't about to let them cut him off. A further grim detail was explained by Michelle Tyler, Joel Jr.'s half-sister. She stated that she had seen the blue containers in Joel Michael Jr.'s car during their Thanksgiving celebrations, two days before the murders. These blue containers would be the ones into which Joel Jr. would place chemicals and parts of his parents' bodies. Day two of the trial, Tuesday, September 29th, saw footage of Joel Jr. in Walmart, just hours after the deaths of his parents, where he was purchasing bandages and plasters to put over the cut on his thumb he sustained after he attacked his dad. On the video, you can see that um, he has what appears to be bandages um, uh, covering some type of injury on his, on his right and left hands. More photos and videos from this house of horrors were also shown. The pot that contained Lisa Guy's head was also shown to the court. Multiple items in the house used for the murder had Joel Jr.'s fingerprints on them. Officers came to the stand to further describe what they found. One officer described the smell, stating that he would never be able to get that smell out of his head. Throughout these graphic descriptions, Joel Jr. sat emotionless, not reacting to the horrific testimonies being given by Knox County police officers. In a case where somebody is charged with premeditated murder, and I've tried many premeditated homicides, uh, you know, usually you have to put premeditation together circumstantially. And many times I have argued to a jury that you will have to put facts A, B, C, D, and E together uh, to prove this element of premeditation. It's not like you'll have a, a notebook or an outline or a diary entry that's going to tell you every time. And uh, how ironic that in, uh, I finally got a case where, uh, where there, I have that. That's exactly what we have. 
we have basically what amounts to a diary that outlines a plan of intention uh, to kill. And we have a motive. Each new detail presented in court revealed the depths of Joel's cruelty. On the third day of the trial, a further forensic investigator described how they removed the liquefying bodies from the property, describing the way the flesh of Joel Guy Sr.'s head had been entirely eaten away by the acid solution, leaving it skeletonized. Joel Jr.'s only friend and old roommate also spoke to the jury. Michael McCracken, who met Joel Jr. at school, had been friends with Joel for nearly 10 years. He described Joel Jr. as a socially awkward person who was becoming more of a recluse the older he got. A phone call between the two after Joel Jr. had been arrested was played for the court, in which Joel said that Michael was the only good thing in his life. And I have to say, I'm all of that aside, I am angry and lost and confused and disappointed and upset and mourning you like your day, but I'm talking to you on the phone and I don't. It's taking everything I have to process and maintain my sanity. I think of you all the time. Joel Jr. had sat through the delivery of horrific evidence and the heartbreaking testimonies from family and friends of his murdered parents. Yet this moment, seeing his best friend in court, was the only time Joel Jr. showed emotion in the trial. The fourth day of the trial, a Thursday, saw the beginning of deliberations. Joel Guy Jr. turned down the opportunity to testify, and the charges against him were read out again. All right, and you do understand if you wanted to, regardless of what your attorneys advise you, that you certainly could. That decision is completely yours. You understand that, Mr. Guy? And so it's your decision after being informed and discussing this with your attorneys to not testify in this case. Is that correct? All right, thank you, sir. Finally, on Friday, October 2nd, 2020, Joel Guy Jr. was found guilty on all charges, including two counts of first-degree murder, three counts of first-degree felony murder, and two counts of abuse of a corpse. Joel was found unanimously guilty on all seven counts, with over 700 pieces of evidence shown to the court. Joel Michael Guy Jr. remains in prison and is incarcerated at the Northwest Correctional Complex in Tiptonville, Tennessee. His sentence will last for 124 years, and he'll be eligible for parole on April 30th, 2136. What are your thoughts on this tragic and heartbreaking story? Do you think anything could have been done to prevent these murders? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Betty and Connor Bowman lived a peaceful life in Rochester, Minnesota. Both hardworking medical professionals, everyone around them believed that they lived together in marital harmony. Together, they were working at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Connor Bowman also worked in poison control with specialist knowledge on various poisons. He was an able and experienced doctor and pharmacist with specialized knowledge that was designed to help people. But when his wife died of seemingly natural causes, a darker side to this knowledge was revealed. Debt, infidelity, and a haunting internet search history. This is the twisted web that surrounded the Bowman's marriage and led to its tragic fatal end. Betty Jo Bowman was born in Wichita, Kansas. She graduated from Bishop Carroll High School in 2009 and went on to get her pharmaceutical doctorate from the University of Kansas in 2017. It had been her dream to be a pharmacist since childhood, and she loved her job working at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. The pharmacist who trained her there when she arrived remembered her to be very reliable and hardworking and smart, and a really nice person. She was in the position to help people, sharing her compassion and warmth with everyone she encountered at work. And she enjoyed it. 
It was in the trajectory of her career as a pharmacist that she met her husband, Dr. Connor Bowman. He also completed his pharmaceutical doctorate at the University of Kansas, graduating in the same year as Betty. According to their LinkedIn profiles, while she completed her residency in Topeka, he remained at the university studying for his MD. This was also where he worked as a poison specialist. The couple had been together since before graduation, and in December 2019, Connor proposed. Betty Jo posted about the engagement on her Facebook page and received a flood of positive comments in return. Her friends and family celebrating and congratulating the happy couple. Working in the same field, they shared the same goals and values. They both regularly donated to fundraisers and shared information about causes they were compassionate about on social media. They sought to combat medical misinformation and help people with their specialized knowledge. On May 31st, 2021, Connor and Betty Bowman were married at the Rhapsody in Independence, Missouri. The couple honeymooned in Hawaii, fulfilling Betty's love of traveling, which had taken her to a wide range of national and international destinations, such as Yosemite National Park, Chicago, New York, the Grand Canyon, Iceland, and the Caribbean. No doubt she had other such spectacular destinations in mind to visit with her new husband. Together, they moved to Rochester, Minnesota, where they both took jobs at the Mayo Clinic. Betty is an operating room pharmacist, and Connor is an internal medicine resident. The Mayo Clinic is one of the most reputable medical centers in the world. It has three campuses across the U.S. in Phoenix, Arizona, Jacksonville, Florida, and Rochester, Minnesota. Its residency program is competitive and very highly regarded. As a result, the Bowmans deemed their move to Minnesota from Kansas a necessary and worthy sacrifice. It would advance both of their careers, even as it cut them off from family and friends who remained in Kansas. They thought what any young couple thinks, that together they could withstand anything that life might throw at them. But this literally picture-perfect marriage, as the couple had an active social media presence and shared pictures of each other often, would soon undergo disturbing changes. The couple reportedly had separate bank accounts due to Connor's debts. They already worked in close proximity, having studied together and moved for the sake of the Mayo Clinic. An unstable financial situation may have added to any existing natural tension, but their friends suspected nothing amiss. Their neighbors knew them as a quiet, reserved couple who kept to themselves. Occasionally, neighbors would meet Betty when she was out walking the dog, a corgi named Sir Crumpet II of Mulberry. Crumpet was her pride and joy, and she enjoyed spoiling him. Betty worshipped her dog. When he was a puppy, he would, she would quite literally brush his teeth every single night. I've never met a more dedicated dog owner. Indeed, it would be this dog that gave one of the only external signs that something was wrong in the house. A neighbor reported hearing the dog's loud barking early one morning, signifying a commotion. And the police arrived at the house soon after. One morning, there was a bunch of uh, their dogs were barking over a whole bunch. I might have heard a bit of shouting or something while we were uh, sleeping. But yeah, and then sure enough, uh, the cops kind of came soon after. But neighbors had no idea why. Betty's tragic fate had until then been considered an accident. On the 16th of August, 2023, Betty was admitted to hospital. She was experiencing stomach pains and dehydration with symptoms similar to those of food poisoning. However, she did not respond to standard treatments. Her condition continued to deteriorate, and she experienced cardiac issues, fluid in her lungs, and eventually she experienced organ failure. Part of Betty's colon was discovered to be necrotic, 
dead tissue, and she was taken into surgery to remove the damaged section. Her worsening condition made one thing clear, that this was not a case of ordinary food poisoning. But what the real cause was, the doctors weren't sure. Connor suggested that Betty was suffering from HLH, a rare autoimmune disease that causes a person's white blood cells to attack their organs. She was tested for the condition, but the results came back inconclusive. With no explanation and no effective treatments, her condition deteriorated to the point that she died in hospital on August 20, 2023. Her death as a result of this sudden, vicious illness shocked and devastated her family and friends. And obviously it was devastating and it was so, so sad. And I just couldn't believe that somebody as young as Betty and as generally healthy as Betty could possibly happen, but work in the intensive care unit. And so I see, you know, unexpected things happen that way. And so knowing that situations like what was supposed to have happened, happened. She had always been healthy and full of life. Her active lifestyle, commitment to her work, and love of traveling all showed Betty to be a vital young woman with a long, rewarding life ahead of her. Instead, she died in a hospital bed at the age of 32. Connor wrote Betty's obituary, listing the cause of her death as a sudden-onset autoimmune and infectious illness, though the test for HLH had been inconclusive. According to court documents, he told the medical examiner's office that Betty's death had been natural and that she would therefore be cremated immediately. He also attempted to cancel the autopsy, stating that his wife did not want to be a cadaver, a body to be dissected on a slab. Perhaps this was a genuine, natural feeling in the midst of his grief. But his other actions surrounding his wife's death did not seem to be those of an innocent, grieving husband. Bowman was corresponding by email with one of the death investigators at the medical examiner's office. He asked the investigator if the toxicology analysis they were conducting would be more thorough than the hospital's typical analysis, the analysis Betty had already undergone. He also asked for a list of exactly what they would be testing for. On August 16th, the day she was admitted to hospital, she had granted Connor access to her protected health information. This access was supposed to expire when Betty died on August 20th. During the short course of her illness, he looked at her electronic health record regularly, accessing admission information, reviewed notes, medications, allergies, and an operating room log. He continued to access this record after her death looking at it daily, though his access should have expired with her death. On August 22nd, he created a documentation encounter within her electronic health record, but he did not add anything to it. Because he had created something within the file, he was then identified as part of her care team, which meant he would continue to access the electronic record without entering his credentials. So why did he want access to her medical records? His behavior after her death was suspicious, but it was his behavior in the week prior that would signal to investigators that perhaps he was more involved in his wife's death than he claimed. Detectives obtained a search warrant for Connor's electronic devices, which included a University of Kansas laptop provided to him for his work in poison control. This work involved researching and answering calls about poisons, affording him a specialized knowledge in the field. As a device for confidential medical work, it had a VPN that's virtual private network authentication process, meaning no one but him could access it. The university looked into search history on their device and network. They stated that Connor had been researching sodium nitrate, Sodium nitrate can be used to limit the transport of oxygen through the body. He had searched for online vendors that sold sodium nitrate, and on August 10th searched food versus industrial grade sodium nitrate. He also accessed a medical journal usually used by medical professionals to search for information on the lethality of substances. The university also said that Connor had been researching colchicine, a drug used to treat gout. 
Neither Connor nor any other employees had received calls requesting information about Colchicine, implying that he was researching it only out of personal rather than professional interest. He had visited the website GoodRx to search for liquid colchicine in conjunction with the website Stripe. Detectives took this to suggest Connor's intent to purchase liquid colchicine. His interest in it was not purely academic. They alleged that he wanted to use it. Colchicine is used to treat sudden attacks of gout. Gout is a form of arthritis that involves painful inflammation in the joints. In too high doses, however, colchicine can lead to poisoning. This poisoning is characterized by three phases. The first occurs 10 to 24 hours after ingestion. This is the gastrointestinal phase which mimics the symptoms of food poisoning. The second phase occurs 24 hours to 7 days after ingestion. In this phase, the person's organs progressively shut down. The third phase is recovery a few weeks later if the person has not already been killed by multi-organ failure and sepsis. The progression of symptoms is eerily similar to Betty Bowman's sudden illness. On August 10th, Connor used the internet to convert Betty's weight into kilograms and multiply it times 0.8. 0.8 milligrams per kilogram is considered the dose at which colchicine can be lethal. When samples were taken and tested by the Minnesota Department of Health, it was found that colchicine was present in her system. She had never been diagnosed with gout or indeed with HLH. She had not been killed by a rare autoimmune disease as her poison specialist husband insisted. Instead, the medical examiner determined that her cause of death was toxic effect of colchicine and that her manner of death was a homicide. On August 10th, 10 days before her death, a friend visited Betty and tasted a smoothie her husband had made for her. It tasted very bad, the friend reported. She recalls finding it strange that he had made her a smoothie since, as the warrant reads, he never made anything for anybody. The two friends even joked that Connor was trying to poison her. Though they weren't serious, Betty decided not to drink the smoothie anyway and threw it out. On August 14th, two days before she became ill, Betty texted a boyfriend. She had a few days off work and was looking forward to seeing him. They met up the following day when she was reportedly healthy. That evening, August 15th, the day before her health deteriorated, she told him she was drinking at home with her husband. The next morning, things had taken a darker turn. She told this friend that she had not slept at all because she felt so ill, and she believed that the cause was an alcoholic drink she had received because it was mixed into a large smoothie. Another female friend of Betty's raised concerns over Betty's death because Betty and Connor were having marital problems. They were in an open relationship, but they had agreed that they would not become emotionally attached to their other partners. But the couple's friend stated that Connor had become infatuated with his new girlfriend. Betty had apparently confronted him and suggested a divorce. The image of marital harmony that the couple shared on Facebook was not the whole story. Three days after Betty's death, a friend visited the house to find that Connor's girlfriend was visiting him and Betty's photos had been taken down. Connor's debts and their separate bank accounts may have created financial tension within their relationship, and he reportedly told a friend that upon Betty's death, he would receive $500,000 in life insurance. The police considered this enough for a motive. They also suggested that further Google searches implied a guilty conscience and a desire to cover his tracks, such as when he searched, Internet browsing history, can it be used in court? Police track package delivery and delete Amazon data police. These searches could be dated to August 5, 2023, nearly two weeks before Betty's death. Investigators believed he had attempted to hide what he had done to his wife, but he had not done so successfully enough. On October 20th, Connor Bowman was arrested in a traffic stop and charged with murder in the second degree. 
A further search conducted on his home revealed a receipt for a $450,000 bank deposit. He had allegedly murdered his wife using his medical knowledge, the very thing that had brought them together, and he had allegedly done so for money. Betty was remembered as a warm, uplifting presence by all who knew her. One co-worker described how on one of her last days alive, Betty came in later than usual because there was a beautiful rainbow and sunrise to observe. Literally a week before she left um, was her describing this like double rainbow that she saw in the morning before work while she was walking crumpet and she like wished us all like happiness and hoped that we found beauty in our day and that was just her she would quite literally just pay me randomly just to she would i even had a flat tire at one point when i was on the way over to walk her dog and i told her i was like hey i'm running late i'm so sorry without even saying anything all of a sudden i get a venmo for 60 dollars that said tire fund she was so proud of how far i've come in the horses and how she's so proud to see me chase my dreams and that she was going to miss me and that crumpet was going to miss me. She saw the beauty in the world and yet she was murdered, allegedly by the person who was supposed to love her the most. What are your thoughts on this tragic story? Do you think justice will be served at trial? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. It's every parent's dream to see their child succeed in school and go off to college on a scholarship. For some kids, the pressure of this dream can become almost unbearable. But few could ever imagine that that pressure could lead to murder. For the Powell family, this dream of college turned into a nightmare when a phone call revealed the secrets their daughter had been hiding and turned their peaceful family home into a bloodbath. Secrets, lies, and the killing witnessed over the phone. This is the story of the tragic death of Brenda Powell. Just unbelievable. Brenda K. Powell had lived in the picturesque city of Akron, Ohio, peacefully since her teens. After graduating from the University of Akron, she went on to work as a child life specialist in the hematology oncology unit at the local children's hospital for the next 28 years. Selflessly dedicated, her obituary describes her as devoted unconditionally to the family she worked with and her own family alike. She founded the hospital's teen oncology program and always made time for her husband and children. Yet the life of this caring wife and mother was soon to be tragically cut short by none other than her own daughter. Sydney Powell, Brenda's teenage daughter, was described as a great student when she attended St. Vincent St. Mary High School in Akron. She played soccer and one year of lacrosse. She had great grades and a high grade point average. Her parents, Brenda and Steve, were very proud. When the time came for Sydney to go to college, together they selected Mount Union University because of its small campus, and also because Sydney wanted to be close to home. Its Alliance Ohio campus was only an hour away from her parents' house. She won a presidential scholarship that included a tuition break, relieving some of the pressure of private school upon her parents and started at college in the fall of 2018. She came home for breaks and kept in touch with her mother. Sydney and Brenda's close relationship was noted by those around them. Brenda was Sydney's best friend. The family trusted each other. They used the Life360 app which allowed its users to track the other's whereabouts at all times. How then did this close family unit fracture? Sydney had a track record of success. Having done so well in high school and having earned herself a scholarship, her parents had no cause to be concerned about her grades. Mount Union had an app they could use to review Sydney's progress at college, but they rarely used it. They did not want to invade Sydney's privacy by checking up on her without good reason. She didn't share any details of her performance at school, not even when she came home for the summer in 2019. Sydney took a summer job with the Akron Rubber Ducks, the local baseball team, working in the kids' zone. 
She went back to campus that fall without sharing a word of the troubles she was facing or the troubles yet to come. Sydney came home again for the winter break, spending a cozy Christmas and New Year's at home with her family in Akron, as though nothing had gone wrong. In January 2020, she went back to Mount Union, but this time there was a problem. In December 2019, Sydney had become unenrolled. In the fall semester, she had failed three out of her four classes. As a result, Sydney received written notice of expulsion. Ms. Gaffney, if you can take a look at that and let me know if you recognize what it is. Yes. This okay, what is that document? This would be this, the letter indicating that Sydney was suspended. Okay, so that's a suspension letter. That's the letter that's sent to students? Yes. Okay. Um, and that directs them on who to contact if they want to appeal or to address what's going on? Yes. Okay. And Ms. Gaffney, who is that letter specifically um, to? This is to Sydney. Now, you mentioned that this, this letter of suspension is sent via certified mail. Is there a, a tracking system that Mountain Union uses to ensure that that student has proper notice? Is there a signature? There is a signature required. Okay. Yeah. And you mentioned um, that once a student is suspended, they... they wouldn't be allowed back into the dorms. Can you explain the process of, of who's allowed in the dorms and who's allowed to use Mount Union's facilities as a student? So to live on campus, you have to be enrolled as a, as a full-time student. And part of that suspension, that student will lose access to all of those availabilities? Yes. Okay. Nevertheless, she went back to Mount Union in January and continued this illusion of normalcy even with her roommate, Lauren Curry, who was her best friend from high school. In late February, Sydney told Lauren that she would be moving away for a time to figure things out. In reality, Sydney had been asked to leave. In a personal meeting, college administrators had told her that she had to move out of her dorm and that her key card access would be terminated. Miss Gaffney, at some point, did you yourself meet Sydney Powell? I did. Okay. And what happened? Um, were you able to contact Ms. Powell? I was. And okay. Sydney came over to the office. Okay. Can you describe that interaction? I think when, when she first came in, I, I said, Sydney, there seems to be some confusion. It's, it, it seems as though you, are, you haven't moved out of your residence hall yet, from what I can tell. Um, and, but you're not enrolled this semester. You don't, um, you're not a student here this semester. And at first she said, she replied to me that, oh, I am, but I am. I am a, I'm still a student here. And that's when I actually addressed the fact that the suspension, I said, Sydney, you, rece you received a suspension letter that you signed for. And, and so we spoke a little bit further and she said, well, yes, she had. And, um, but she was, had been hoping to get things changed or fixed. And, and so she had, had been trying to, to work things out. So she did acknowledge that she knew she about did her acknowledge suspension. Then that she, she knew she was suspended. When the administrators offered to call her parents to explain the situation, difficult it can be, she was adamant that she had already told them what was happening. The idea of the college contacting her parents directly about her own failure was visibly distressing. After having been a success in high school, she couldn't bear to disappoint them. Far from figuring things out, she spent late February paying cash for hotel rooms to maintain the illusion to her friends and to her parents that she hadn't been kicked out of college. Her parents initially suspected nothing. Sydney went to great lengths to disguise her academic situation, which was worsening by the minute. On February 25th, 2020, Brenda texted Sydney asking, why do I always feel like you're scamming me? Just remember, you need to keep the grades to keep your scholarship. Sydney responded, my grades are good, thank you very much. By this point, she'd been evicted from her dorm. But Brenda's momentary suspicion was not enough to see through Sydney's lies. The only clue was the college online portal. When Steve Powell, her father, tried to sign into the portal to send an additional check to cover tuition fees, it denied him access. He asked Sydney why it wouldn't let him into the portal. Do you have any information that something might be going on with Sydney at, and Mount Union? The only thing that I knew is when I tried to sign on to the, uh, like their whatever app that they have on the website, it kept kicking me out. Why were you trying to get into that portal? 
seeing because the, the 529 plan didn't cover all the tuition for the year so I had to make a, a personal check okay so I had to see how much that was okay and um, when you had difficulty logging onto that portal what did you do I asked Sydney what was going on about it okay and what did she say there was a mistake with Mount Union okay and she looked into it okay and 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 at that point, you had no reason not to trust Correct. what she's telling you. Yeah. Correct. Steve had no reason not to believe her. She had always been a trustworthy child with a history of academic success. No one could have expected what would happen next. On March 3, 2020, Steve received a call at work from Mount Union. Officials at the college had to speak to him as a matter of urgency. They informed him that Sydney was no longer enrolled at the college. When he asked how long this had been the case, all they said was, you'd have to ask her. I believe Mount Union called me. I, they called me, and I, the conversation was that Sydney wasn't enrolled anymore. And then I asked for how long, and they said, you have to ask her. Okay. And, and I'm sure that came as a shock to you? Yes. And, and again, they, they said they, you have to ask. I know it sounds cold, but they're saying... You have to ask her because they can't give you any more information, right? That was my assumption. Steve checked the Life360 app to find Sydney was at home. Shocked by the news that she had been lying about her performance in college while he had been writing checks to pay for it, Steve left work to confront her. What prompted you to go home, to, to leave work and go home? Because I saw in the app she was home, which I thought was a little bit early. Okay. The 360 life. The 360 app showed that she was home? Yes. If, if someone on that app it comes home, do you get like a little buzz or notification on your phone? If it's set up, you can. Okay. So did, were, did you just happen to see that on the 360 app or did it give you like a notification? I might have got a notification. I don't recall. Okay. So you get a notification that Sydney's at home, correct? Yes. When you see that, you go home. Correct. Right, and, and why did you go home? See why she was home. Okay. Did you have any concern for her at that time? Just because Mount Union said she wasn't enrolled, but no. I was just going to go home and see why she was home so early. And okay. And did you take your phone with you when you went home? No. And, and why not? I just left it at work so the 360 app wouldn't show me coming home. So that she couldn't use the same app to see him coming and avoid this necessary confrontation. Arriving at around 11.30, he found her alone at home. Sydney told him that she was merely having some trouble at college, but that she was still enrolled and still attending some classes with her friend and roommate, Lauren. Steve responded with understanding. He told her that they'd get through this semester and that if she needed to take the summer off, they'd work through it. So she told you she was essentially still enrolled but just having some, some trouble? I don't know if she used the word trouble, but... She, and again, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. You tell me. Yeah, no, she what, just, what did she say? She was... Again, I don't remember the details, but I remember she said she was still going to some of her classes with her friend Lauren. Do you remember telling her that, you know, you, you can't run away from your problems you have to face them i said we'd go through you guys get through, through this semester and if you needed to take the summer off or go to we would work through it i remember she said you know all her friends have their shit together and she doesn't and i told her no that's not the, that's not true she said she didn't sydney said i don't have my shit together but my friends do yeah she didn't know what she wanted to do it sounded like sure she felt lost and afraid of disappointing her family. Unsure how to handle these emotions she had kept hidden from him for so long, he suggested they call Brenda, who was at work at the children's hospital. Brenda decided to come home to talk to Sydney, and Steve made the fatal decision to leave before she got there. Brenda was an emotionally sensible and empathetic woman, more than capable of de-escalating highly emotional situations, as she had to do every day in her work with children and teenagers who had cancer. Steve couldn't be blamed for asking her to help with her daughter's sudden crisis. For the next hour, Brenda and Steve kept in touch via text messages. 
And at 1241, Steve sent her the last text he would ever send her. What did you discuss with Sydney? Brenda would never respond. Brenda had left a phone message with the administrative office at Mount Union asking to discuss Sydney's situation. When college administrators Michelle Gaffney and John Fraser arrived at the office, they returned the call straight away. Phone records show that Brenda picked up the phone at 1236.45. Dean Fraser was sitting at his desk and I was sitting next to it. He, he dialed, uh, the phone was answered, and um, Mrs. Powell answered. You say Mrs. Powell, is that Brenda who Brenda, answered? Brenda answered, yes. Okay. Um, and what did you tell Brenda at that time? So uh, Dean Fraser was, um, was speaking and, and simply said, um, Brenda, uh, this is Dean Fraser. I'm sitting here with Michelle Gaffney, our associate dean of students. We're returning your call, and that's about as far as, as we got. Did Brenda respond to, to that introduction at all? Yeah. Okay. Yes. What did she I think say? I think he asked, "Is this Brenda Powell?" Oh, okay. And she said yes, and he and then he identified himself. Okay. And Miss Gaffney, what happened next? Um. There was a very large or a very loud sort of thud sound, like a pound a pounding or a thud, um, accompanied by a by a pretty loud scream, um, and um, the scream might have actually pr been first, and then the thud. Okay. As I think about it, and then um, there was sort of a an expulsion. The other sound that I heard at that same time, or, or right after, was sort of an expulsion of air, like the air was knocked out of somebody. Okay. Um, I, I'd always heard that expression of the air being knocked, you know, having the wind knocked out of you, but I didn't. That's actually what it sounded like. Um, and then several more repeated thuds. I don't, I don't know how to describe the sound. No, oh, and that's okay. And you could, you and Mr. Frazier could hear this from the other end of the phone. From the other, it was on speakerphone, right? Okay. Yeah. Did you hear any communication during these thuds? Just the screaming. Um, and, and, this, um, and so we were both talking into the phone saying, you know, what's going, is some, what's happening? Is, are, are you okay? What's, can we, do you need help? What, what's what's going on? Yeah, can you can describe your mindset at this time? Yeah, uh, I mean, I very definitely felt like someone was being attacked. The call with the administrators dropped after an estimated six or seven thuds and continual screaming. They called back and received no answer until the third attempt, when someone picked up at 12.40.15. Only three and a half minutes after the beginning of the attack, at a minute before Steve's final text message to his wife. Frazier, shaken by what they had just heard, managed to ask, Brenda, is that you? Are you there? A voice responded, yes, this is Brenda. But the voice was not Brenda. The voice was that of Sidney Powell. Now, Miss Gaffney, did you recognize that voice on the line? Yeah. Okay, was that Brenda Powell? It was not Brenda. Who did you recognize that voice to I, I was sure it was Sydney. Both Dean Fraser and I looked at each other and and and, sh and sort of shook our heads at each other and said, "That's not, that's not Brenda." Um, and he then said, "I, I don't, Sydney. I think this is you. This, this is not Brenda." And what happened next? The, f the the phone went dead. Okay. And Miss Gaffney, what did you do next? We called the Akron police. But by that point, I had the phone number. I had the phone number up and, and the address. And so we called the Akron police and indicated we felt there was some sort of situation at this house and that they needed to send someone right away. They're on the phone and um, there was a lot of screaming going on. So he couldn't really say if it was like a physical fight, but just heard like a lot of uh, yelling and screaming going on. And then he tried calling back twice and there was no, um, uh, there was no call back. In a single moment, a peaceful family home had become the scene of a crime. Impersonating her mother was not Sydney's only attempt at covering up what had happened. After the disastrous phone call, she set herself to staging the crime scene. She broke a window to make it look as though there had been a break-in, which would align with the story she would go on to tell the police. That there had been a break-in and her mother had told her to flee the house. But this scene was clearly staged. There was blood on the outside of the door near the broken window, suggesting it must have been broken only after the crime had been committed. 
After murdering her mother, she coldly and callously took steps to cover up her own guilt. At 12.51, Steve Powell received a call from a detective friend who had heard that police units were being dispatched to the Powell home. Steve immediately phoned his house and spoke to Sydney, who became hysterical when she heard that police were on their way and repeated the break-in story. Steve could only wait helpless at work as his family life broke apart at home. The police initially found Sydney hysterical. This hysteria soon evaporated, however, and she became catatonic, lying on the ground in the fetal position as the enormity of what she had done began to sink in. There was a cast iron skillet on the floor in the master bedroom, alongside a bloodied steak knife. These implements of an ordinary domestic household, no doubt used by Brenda herself to cook family meals, had been weaponized against her. As the police examined the scene, the series of events only glimpsed by Steve and the college administrators over the phone became horribly clear. The forensic pathologist concluded that Brenda Powell had died as a result of multiple blunt and sharp force injuries. Sydney had hit her mother multiple times over the head with the heavy cast iron skillet. She then fetched a steak knife and in a frenzy stabbed her mother repeatedly in the neck at least 23 times. Cuts and bruising to Brenda's face, arms, and hands suggest that she had attempted to defend herself from Sydney. Sydney, her beloved daughter, whose academic failures and emotional turmoil had until now been kept a secret. The revelation of this secret led to Sydney's eruption and Brenda's tragic death. No one denies that Sydney killed her mother. At trial, however, her attorneys contended that the attack had occurred in the middle of a psychotic break, meaning she could not comprehend that her actions were wrong. As evidence, they pointed to her catatonic state after the killing. They also suggested that her continued denial of her own reality that she'd been kicked out of college was in fact evidence of schizophrenia and brought in three psychological experts to testify to this fact. Sydney had told one of them that she did not remember the attack at all. Her last memory of her mother, she said, was of sitting on the couch with her mother as she comforted Sydney. Sydney then got up and went into the basement. She said she did not remember anything further until the hospital after the attack. The prosecution pointed to Sydney's methodical staging of the scene as evidence of her mental fitness at the time. They called a further clinical psychologist as a rebuttal witness who testified that she had diagnosed Sydney with borderline personality traits and unspecified anxiety disorder. The psychologist concluded that Sydney was malingering, feigning mental unfitness in order to pervert the course of justice. Ultimately, the jury agreed. On September 20th, 2023, Sydney Powell was found guilty on all counts. Purposeful murder, felony murder, felonious assault, and tampering with evidence. She murdered her mother and attempted to cover it up. On September 28, 2023, Sydney Powell was sentenced to 15 years to life in prison. She will be 38 years old by the time she is eligible for parole. Ms. Powell, is there anything you want to say to me at this time? Oh, all right. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, to the victims, to the family and friends, I am terribly sorry for your loss here. I cannot imagine what you have been through. I have received and read all of the letters that have been sent to me. I have considered the evidence that was brought into evidence um, at the trial, the statements of counsel, and all of the information that is before me at this time. Based upon the facts and circumstances of this case and in consideration of the relevant sentencing factors, including seriousness and recidivism, and applying the minimum sanction that the court has determined will protect the public and punish the offender without imposing an unnecessary burden on state and local resources, the court imposes the following sentence. On count one, ma'am, I sentence you to an indefinite sentence of 15 years to life in the Ohio Department of Corrections. On count four of the indictment, 
I sentence you to three years in the Ohio Department of Corrections. Those two sentences to be run concurrent with and not consecutive to each other. Ma'am, understand that you have a right to appeal this decision and that notice of appeal must be filed when within 30 days of the sentencing judgment entry. Your attorney has indicated to me that you are without funds to hire an attorney to represent you for appeal. Is that correct? And you wish for me to appoint counsel to represent you? Yes. All right. I will do that and we will try and get that done before you leave the Summit County Jail. Uh, Ma'am, I will not fine you. I will not assess you court costs in this matter. Good luck to you, Ms. Powell. Thank you. We're adjourned. In Sydney's efforts to conceal her own academic failures and her paranoid fear of disappointing her parents, Sydney only derailed her life further and caused an unimaginable tragedy that ripped her family apart. What are your thoughts on this tragic story? Do you believe Sydney's fate was justice? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. So it seems very loving and there's no doubt in my mind that she loves him and I know that and from how I've always seen it, he loves her. So we are right outside Capitol Reef right now in a uh, free dispersed camp spot. Autopsy results are confirming the remains found in Wyoming over the weekend belong to Gabby Petito. As we've been reporting, the 22-year-old went missing while on vacation with her fiance, Brian Laundrie. He returned from the trip without Petito and has since disappeared. They were friends in high school. They both graduated from Bayport Blue High School in Bayport, New York, and began dating as of March 2019. It just so happened that their friendship rekindled and soon turned into something more, something darker. The relationship was intense and things moved quickly. By July 2020, they were engaged, but beyond the perfect facade Gabby Petito had created for her followers on social media was a much more unstable relationship. Rose Davis, Petito's best friend at the time, remembers this very instability. On the outside, it, he's very charismatic, so it seems very loving, and there's no doubt in my mind that she loves him, and I know that, and from how I've always seen it, he loves her. Um, well, we were supposed to go line dancing, it was ladies' night, and her drive is about 30 minutes to me, and halfway there, she realized her uh, ID was missing. And so it caused a really big argument because Brian just didn't want her to go out. And it was a jealousy issue. And um, it caused a huge argument between them. And she came over and cried and just talked to me about what happened and told me all that she was comfortable telling me. I do believe that their relationship, as they kept going on, was getting a little, yeah, problematic. I mean, just seemed like there was more and more arguments and everything she did, I feel like, you know, he thought was wrong. But Gabby insisted that they were fine and they wanted to do something fun before the wedding. So they planned a road trip and for the very worst of reasons, it would be one to remember. Gabby purchased what was going to be she and Brian's vehicle for the road trip in December 2020 a white Ford van which they would later modify. Their plan had been carefully mapped out, a trip to the American West Coast where they would stop to explore state and national parks. Gabby maintained regular contact with her parents throughout the trip, just like she always did, and made sure to keep her followers up with what she and Laundry were doing. Reaching Gabby was easy. After all, she was involved with social media. That is, she was until suddenly she was not. Two months into the road trip, a 911 call initiated by a bystander reported a domestic abuse incident. Inside a white Ford van with a Florida license plate, the caller spotted a girl being slapped across the face. It was Petito. Hi, uh, I'm calling. I'm right on the corner of Main Street by Moonflower and... We're driving by, and I'd like to report a domestic dispute to Florida with a white van, Florida license plate, white land, gentleman, Where's about 5'6", beard. They just drove off. They're going down Main Street, 
they made a uh, a right onto Main Street from Moonflower. And what were they doing? Cooperative, but um, what do you say? What were they doing? Uh, we drove by and the gentleman was slapping the girl. Who was slapping her? Yes. Following this 911 call placed on August 12, 2021, the couple's encounter with the city of Moab, Utah's police officers is filmed on a body cam. This footage would end up representing a vital part of what was to become one of 2021's largest homicide investigations. I didn't get that far into okay, it. She so was she was hyperventilating. She's a saying bit. that they don't, they don't drink. But at the point when you put them up, we don't drink or anything. I was, I was, yeah, it. I was yelling at him, and then when and he turned your lights on, I like kind of fucked his arm. Like there's no, there's no she said she thing was like hit the curb. You said it was, it was Gabby. Yeah. I'm sorry, I really thought it was Gabby. Yeah. Quick question: You said you were hitting him in the arm. Did you grab the steering wheel? No, I didn't. You did not touch the steering wheel. Only, only, only for like a second because I just saw the lights come on, and it was more just like dirty, like you know. But did you grab the steering wheel and like no. swerve or anything like no, that? No, no, no. Okay. I didn't touch the steering wheel at all. Okay. She was already. I don't want to. She's already swinging, and I was like, yeah. a lot of angles, a lot of nails, a lot of rings. Yeah, you got yeah. three scratches in your neck. You got one on your left side of your head. You got one in your face here, and you got four blood bleeding from her. So you just carried on to the the couple described their altercation as much more insignificant than what was initially signaled to the police officers. Reportedly, both the male and female reported they are in love and engaged to be married and desperately didn't wish to see anyone charged with a crime. After evaluating the totality of the circumstances, I do not believe the situation escalated to the level of a domestic assault as much as that of a mental health crisis, claimed a Moab police representative. Instead, Gabby was described as confused and emotional. The couple were separated for the night by the police, and Petito slept in the van while laundry was taken to a nearby motel. Five days later, on August 17, 2021, Laundry flew to Tampa, Florida from Salt Lake City. Supposedly, he flew home to obtain some items and empty and close the storage unit to save money as they contemplated extending the road trip. It is unknown whether this was all that Laundry did in his week-long absence. And it is not out of the question that Laundry took some time to create a plan. But on August 23rd, he returned to Salt Lake City and rejoined Petito. Four days later, the couple were spotted in Wyoming, once again engaged in an altercation. Petito was reportedly in tears throughout the couple's entire visit to the restaurant, while Laundry, oblivious to the other people around him, screamed at her. The couple kept going in and out of the restaurant and Laundry supposedly lost his temper at the restaurant staff as well. On the 29th of August, two days after the couple's restaurant incident, Miranda Baker and Norma Jean Jalovic gave Laundry two separate rides while in Wyoming. Hi, my name is Miranda Baker, and on August 29th, my boyfriend and I picked up Brian at Grand Teton National Park at 5 30 at night at Coulter Bay. Between the couple's most recent altercation and when Laundry was spotted on the 29th of August, there is a complete gap in their timeline. The case suggests that those two days were actually crucial in terms of finding a concrete motive behind Laundry's crisis. Just what were the couple fighting about? And what motive could have possibly led to what Laundry was about to do? By this date, Petito's parents had lost most contact with their daughter. Baker gave Laundry a ride to the Spread Creek dispersed camping area, and from there, Jalovic picked him up at 6.15 p.m., just a few minutes after Baker recorded Laundry exiting her vehicle. The very next day, Petito's family received their final text from their daughter. At this point, it is believed that the couple were in Grand Teton National Park, Wyoming. We would FaceTime, call, text frequently. She kept me updated on this whole trip. Did it start to dwindle? Did her communication start to fade or? No, not until, um, I, re I received a text on the 30th. That was the last communication I had. Petito wrote, no service in Yosemite, and that was it. Her family instantly suspected that the text had not been sent by their daughter, but did not overthink it. After all, 
even if Brian had texted them instead, it should mean that she was safe, because he loved her, right? But whatever Brian felt for Gabby wasn't love. There are no records of what happened in the days between August 29th and September 1st, but here is our theory. Petito had long been a victim of domestic abuse. Her friends saw it, her parents saw it, but Gabby did not. And after all, she was the only one who could change her own mind. So Gabby stayed with Brian. She was even going to marry him. She stayed with him in spite of his outbreaks, in spite of his threats and possessiveness, and she hoped that if she did better, she could fix him. In many cases, that would be true, but Laundrie was deeply unstable. Recent diary entries which were recovered from Laundry, as well as previous reports on his behavior, suggest that he often lacked control over his actions and tended to make drastic decisions. Gabby fell into the middle of that. Sometime between August 29th and 30th, they started fighting again. Laundry probably hit Petito. It would not have been the first time, but this time he found that he couldn't stop. And soon enough, Gabby, whose only mistake was being trustful, was betrayed by the man she thought loved her, and she died slowly, with Laundry's hands around her neck. But only two days after Petito's final text, Laundry returned to his family's home in Northport, Florida, and Brian was alone. A few days later, the three Laundries left for a campground about 75 miles away from their home. In the meantime, Gabby's family had heard nothing from their daughter. On September 11th, almost two weeks since Petito's family had last heard back from her, and after placing multiple calls requesting the Laundry family's help in locating her, Petito was reported as missing. Northport police visited the Laundry home in hopes of talking to them about Petito's disappearance. Instead, they were met by the Laundry's family lawyer who furnished them the family's contact details. On September 15th, Laundry withdrew over $1,000 using Petito's card, after which a search for the man was initiated. The following day, in a letter read by the Petito family, Laundry's parents were urged to help in the search for their daughter. It's scary and heartbreaking. I don't know how to describe it, to be honest with you. We are, we are running out of time, and... Um, we're scared for Gavin. We think she might be in danger, and we just we just want him to talk. Just tell us where where was she? Where did you leave her? You know, I, I wanted to just know what happened, and uh, I'm I'm getting angry now at this point, as you can tell. I'm uh, I'm beyond frustrated. You know, as a mother to another mother, I, I beg his mother to make him speak, or at least for the parents to say something. In response, the Laundries asked police to visit their home the following day at which time they revealed that they had not seen Brian since September 14th. Five days later, on September 19th, Gabby Petito's remains were found in Grand Teton, Wyoming. It was almost a month later that Petito's cause of death was made public. Gabby was strangled to death. Just hoping that at that moment... That she was in a place that she wanted to be, looking at the beautiful mountains. It's something you never think is going to, you, you see it. You never, ever think it's going to be yours. It's just, a, it's surreal. A week after Petito's cause of death was released, Laundry's human remains were found at Florida's Carlton Reserve. A notebook belonging to Laundry was also found. A month later, it was confirmed that Laundrie had died due to a self-inflicted gunshot wound. He couldn't bear the guilt. On January 21st, 2023, after the contents of Laundrie's handbook was reviewed, a passage containing Laundrie's tragic confession was released. And again, this is effectively the confession written by Brian Laundrie. Quote, I ended her life. I thought it was merciful that it was what she wanted, but I see now all the mistakes I made. I panicked, I was in shock, but from the moment I decided, took away her pain, I knew I couldn't go on without her. A month later, on February 14th, 2023, the Petito family filed its first suit, which was against the Laundry family. They claimed that Laundry's parents knew of Gabby's death before their son was found, 
and that they hid it from the Petitos. Knowing that Gabby was dead, knowing their son had murdered her, knowing where the body was. The action came as a result of a letter from Laundrie's mother found in his belongings. She offered her son to help bury a body. The letter ends with a task for Laundrie, burn after reading. The Laundries, however, claim that the letter was written before Petito's disappearance. Conduct has to be atrocious and utterly intolerable in a civilized society. You know, people who are faced with difficult challenges have to make difficult choices. The trial will ensue on the 23rd of August, 2023. The Petitos also filed a second lawsuit, this time against Moab, Utah's police department, claiming that not enough action was taken to protect Gabby during their encounter with her. Action which could have potentially saved her life. They released a selfie taken by Petito on the day of the Utah evidence, hoping that it wasn't too late for their daughter's suffering to be appropriately acknowledged. The Petito's attorney stated, According to available data, the image was taken at 4.37 p.m., at or before the approximate time of the initial 911 call. But the issue at heart is not solely Gabby's unfortunate story. It is that there are thousands of Gabbies out there, all suffering silently. In response, the Petito family joined Utah lawmakers on January 30th, 2023 as the Senate unanimously voted in favor of the Lethality Assessment Protocol, a new law which sees officers obligated to ask 11 questions when assessing possible cases of domestic abuse. If the victim answered in the affirmative to any of the questions, the officers would be obligated under the law to refer them to an advocacy group for support. Gabby's death must lead to change. It shows the consequences of not prioritizing one's experiences and feelings, and the fact that danger could be sleeping in the very same bed you are. On the 18th of March, 2023, Gabby's father posted for what would have been her 24th birthday a reminder to the public that they play a vital role in locating missing persons. He wrote, Gabby would be turning 24 tomorrow, and I'm watching the sunrise. Chandler Halderson was your usual 23-year-old. He attended his local college in Madison, Wisconsin. He had a long-term girlfriend and two dogs. He still lived at home, but he was working on that. He was getting his IT degree, and then he was going to accept a job offer from SpaceX and move to Florida. In the meantime, he was going to keep working remotely for an insurance company. Or was he? This is the question that Halderson's parents, Krista and Bart, kept asking themselves. When was he actually attending college? His father worked from home some days, and he didn't believe that his son was actually attending at all. And why was Chandler always broke if he had that swanky insurance job? Could his workplace's payroll software really not have been fixed for months on end? And how, exactly, would he have gotten that SpaceX job? Chandler didn't even hold a degree, and didn't have any work experience either. Where did the truth lie? Chandler's parents would find out the hard way. At The Decoder, we create detailed, analytical videos presenting you the truth from all angles. Your support is what keeps us going, so make sure you hit the like and subscribe buttons. On the 29th of June 2021, Bart Halderson made a call to Madison College, where his son was supposedly enrolled. On the other end of the phone was a very confused administrative worker. Bart, who had introduced himself as his son, Chandler, was asking for his graduate diploma. But not only did Chandler never finish college, he had a $2,000 debt to the college and had not been enrolled in any classes since a year prior. Bart set up an in-person meeting with the college and his son, which was going to address some of Chandler's many lies to his parents. 
Halderson had been proving his attendance to his parents by showing them emails between himself and a couple of college employees. However, neither of them was real. Halderson went as far as buying and using burner phones which corresponded with the email addresses he created. But Bart never showed up to the 1st of July meeting, and neither did Chandler. Some of Holderson's neighbors reported a bright flash which had come from the Holderson's home on the afternoon of July 1st. Inside the home, this bright flash was followed by the sound of a broken glass chimney and the thud of Bart's body hitting the floor. His last text to his son was, Ready when you are, at 2.15pm. After which, Bart's health app stopped recording data and his phone was turned off. Only a few minutes later, Krista, Chandler's mum, receives a string of texts saying, Dad's phone died. Text or call and get soda on your way home. Krista arrived home around three hours after Halderson's murder of his father. Her manner of death is still unknown. After murdering his unsuspecting parents, Halderson most likely brought them down to his basement where he dismembered them. Body parts were later found belonging to Krista and Bart Halderson. Bart's torso, missing its head, arms or legs, but still dressed, and Krista's entire right leg and left foot. Later on the same day, Halderson's neighbors remember noticing the strong smell of burning wood, which soon turned into a smell they described was alike to barbecuing a large pork. A beaming light could be seen inside the Halderson home. The fireplace was on. In fact, the fire was larger and brighter than usual, particularly at around 3 a.m., considering Chandler was attempting to burn his parents' remains. A total of 230 bone fragments have since been retrieved from the fireplace's ash trap. Halderson was interrogated on the 8th of July and arrested straight after his interview, on account of sharing misinformation about a missing person. Today we present you a detailed analysis of Halderson's interrogation and of his guilty conscience. Halderson walks into the interview and sits down awkwardly. He doesn't seem comfortable with himself like an overgrown child still wearing his high school swim team hoodie from 2013, Halderson awaits the officers. Halderson's anxiety can be felt through the screen as he walks into the interrogation room where he is briefly left by himself. He runs his sweaty palms down his jeans and leans forward, in a position which denotes rigidity. As time passes, Halderson eases into his chair. He starts looking around, exploring his surroundings more. He stretches out his legs. He had been tensing them, maybe even subconsciously. The more he is left by himself, the more restless Halderson becomes. His legs are itching. He needs to keep changing positions on the chair, and his breathing speeds up. He had been left alone with his thoughts, and his thoughts are dominated by feelings of anxiety. Halderson gets up and puts his ear against the wall, listening to see if he is being spoken about. Do they know he is guilty? Could they know? As soon as he hears movement from outside the room, Halderson moves his head away from the wall, but places it back shortly. Halderson looks around the room as he realizes that his eavesdropping had probably been recorded. But where are those cameras? He looks around and counts them. His behavior is becoming increasingly suspicious to any officers that might be watching. Halderson is instructed to switch chairs so that he is facing the camera. As he sits down and asks the officers, What's we can immediately notice anxiety in the tone of his voice. He does not make eye contact as he asks this, instead looking down. 
Alderson is wide-eyed and his position on the chair is constrained, indicating that he is receiving adrenaline. As Chandler is told what the interview will be on, he furrows his brows. He is worried. He gesticulates widely, interrogating the officer's reasons and wondering just how much do they know. So yesterday, uh, July 7th, I came to your house um, where you live with your parents, Bart and Krista um, Helderson. And um, the reason I was there is because you had gone to the Windsor Police Department and reported them missing, right? Yes. Okay. So you, re you reported your parents missing. We got some information from you yesterday. Um, we've been following leads last night, um, working today to, you know, go through different things, um, just trying to locate them, right? Um, so I, I guess if you want to start with, let's just go back to, to last Wednesday. Um, Wednesday. I was with my dad. We, what time Wednesday? I remember it. It was kind of a bad day. Okay. Why was it a bad day? Um, well, my mom had work, so she was gone. Um, my dad and I were watching something over lunch. It was uh, the Wheel of Fortune, and we have we normally have the couch, like with our back facing our the table we sat at at the end of you coming. Downstairs or upstairs? Downstairs. Okay. You know, that room with the TV. I tossed the ball and. I smashed the glass Okay. with the dog, the dog's help, uh, that, yeah, set my dad off. And... As Holderson is discussing what had happened the previous Wednesday, what stands out is that his speech is slow and he is taking calculated breaks between his sentences, almost as if he were retracing a memorized text. We tried to clean it up. Okay. I don't know about him, but I got injured. Um, but he was mad. He didn't really talk to me too much that day. Uh, my mom got home at five, I believe. I, that's her normal, five twenty to five thirty. What time does she work? You know, seven thirty is when she leaves. I don't know her hours, but I know when she leaves okay. at seven thirty. And then all the way up till 5, and she, she comes home 5.20, 5.30. Did she come home about 5.20, 5.30 that day? I believe so, yeah. Okay. So you, you were tossing a ball. What type of ball was it? It's, it's this gross, hairy tennis ball that oh, okay. Rizzo loves. All right. Just like a green tennis ball, like a normal? Yeah. Normal. Okay. The, with a squeaker, not, not oh. like a tennis racket ball. But they don't chew balls. My dog chews those out of the, any tennis ball. They just chew the squeakers out, and then they don't play with them anymore. Yeah. Um, all right, so you're just tossing that around, um, broke the fireplace glass. Uh, you said you were injured. What type of injury? I you? got a pretty deep hole in my foot. The, uh, last night, Mary looked at it, and she said the reason it keeps bleeding is because there's glass in it. Oh, so, that's the... You showed us your toe. Yeah, I showed the okay. detective leaf. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, once I, oh, Wednesday, back to Wednesday, yeah. once I got all the glass out of the dog's hair, um, she didn't sustain any injuries. Good. Uh, nothing even on her nose. She got it with her shoulder bone, I believe. And the rest, he didn't really talk to me. I went back to doing, like, a job search, kind of just shitting my day away. Just getting games, YouTube maybe. Uh, that's when I came across one of the jobs I liked. Um, but then five o'clock rolled up by, and we mom came home. Um, dinner. What did you guys have once tonight? I couldn't tell you. Okay. Who made it? I think it was probably just stuff from the fridge. Okay. I, don't, I think we all did our own thing again. Sure. Another detail in Halderson's body language which is indicative of his anxiety is his constant touching of either his legs or arm, which acts as a soothing mechanism. 
Halderson is also avoiding eye contact for the large majority of the interview, indicating dishonesty. By the way, a detective at my house said something's happened, and while we were leaving, people were going inside. Is there a warrant for my house? Should there be? No, I'm just wondering if... Okay. Halderson abruptly changes the subject of the questioning, this time shifting his tone to an assertive one and looking the detective in the eye. This behavioral switch is sensed by the detective, and when challenged, Halderson returns to his previous attitude. The instability of Halderson's behavior suggests that he has a hidden motive behind his question. Can they go um, in? As far as I know, they were at your house and they were going to be there talking to you to ask if you would come up here and talk yeah, to us. Yeah, but um, Officer Haley just like walked pretty much in to the gate, you know, the gate on the outside. She just kind of walked in. I was, I was wondering. If was we that a when you were getting your wallet? Uh, no, we were. We were. Um, I was in the car waiting to leave. I was just wondering if everything's okay because okay. she said something's happened. Okay. And we need to go down. Alright. I'll find out what that's about. Well, has anything bad happened? No. Not sure. Alright. So, so Wednesday night, mom comes home. Um, dad was angry. Was was he yelling or? What was, how, how would you describe dad being angry? It was, if you, he would yell if you said something to him, I guess. If you talk to him, if you give him his space, he'll be okay. So, Wednesday night. Oh. Wednesday. If you just how, give him his space, that's all we did. Just give him his space, he, he wouldn't yell or do anything. Okay. That's all we had to do. Um, just Ma and I went to clean, uh, do some laundry, uh, make our beds, stuff like that. We had an early night, no, no TV that night. Gotcha. Um, what time did your parents go to bed Wednesday night, do you think? I was in bed at 8. I, you were? Know. Yeah. Okay. As Halderson proceeds with the events of the following day, we can notice yet another telltale sign of anxiety. He clenches his jaw. In fact, his entire stance at this point in the interview indicates a high level of unease, from his hugging his body to being slouched over in a tense position, with his head down. What time is it? Six. Okay. Dogs. We talked about that yesterday. 6 a.m. is kind of your deal, right? 6 a.m.? Yeah, that internal clock now. Yeah. I haven't used the thing for a while. Right. 6. So, I don't off any breakfast, so I kind of just stay in my room on my phone. Um, help my mom out getting ready in the morning. She, she left for work at 7.30. I got her, um, whatever she had to do, I don't know, was it? it was meaningless tasks, like just daily, like pillowcase changes and sheet changes, stuff like that, you know, in the morning. Before work? Yeah, that's what we always do. Um, Then she's gone. Uh, my dad starts the grill around 8.39 in the morning. To, yeah, to get the temperature right. Was he working from home that day? or? Yes. Okay. We, um, we ate. The grill, nothing really happened between that. We kind of either were outside with the dogs from the lighting of the grill, him going in taking a couple calls and now and then or emails or something. <laughs> but we just kind of watched the grill and waited to get it set steady at uh, the hamburgers for 350-ish. Okay. Then, so th yeah, we just kind of waited.
sorry, I'm really trying mm-hmm. to move the memory. Um, That's fine. Then, yeah, we went to go do our own things. I went back to a little bit more job searching. This time I branched into DeForest instead of just Windsor mm-hmm. looking. He went back to work. We planned on... Something went wrong. Then we just kind of hung out, and my mom gets home, and I uh, start the, I start uh, shrimp scampi for my dad because that's what he wanted. But we didn't have shrimp, so I, I made shrimpless scampi. Um, uh, that's that's where they told me while we were eating it. They they were gonna go with their friends and I was like oh cool. Um, well, and they said they were going cabin. Yeah. Well, okay. we're going up north. Up That's north how they so. referred to it. Who said that, mom or dad? Ma. Friday morning, I woke up. They had left with the stuff. It was all set out. Uh, they remembered the gas. Alright, so um, Friday during the day, I just played video games, kind of. Yeah, then after work, I believe that was the day Cat came over. After whose work? Cat, she is oh, five. her work. Five is her work when she, okay. she was off. I believe she came over. She, um, I believe she stayed with me on that couch that night. So she spent the night over. Yeah. What'd you do before you Wait, went to bed? That was Friday night. That might have been my own night. I might be wrong. I'm wrong. Okay. I think I spent that night alone. I just kind of gamed online uh, with some of my friends. Well, I said Saturday night. I'm so sorry, guys. Yeah, no worries, man. Let me get to Sunday. It's the fourth. In the morning, I'm a little worried about my family. I think I called my mom. Oh, throughout, I've called. I, I don't know the times, though. Throughout the weekend, I mean. But I called my mom, I believe, in the morning, I guess, along those lines. And I get a text from her. It was a text message. It wasn't even an iMessage, message, so mm-hmm. I assume she said White Lake today. So she sent it that day. Um, I couldn't figure out where she was there, because it was a text. There was no iMessage, message, so I kind of just like left it at that. They're safe. They're alive. We went to my house and back to Cress's. We were late. Okay. For dinner. What were you guys driving? Were you in your cat's car? red Subaru? Okay. Was she driving or you? She she okay. drives that cat's her car. Red Subaru, so yeah. She okay. it's at my house right now. Oh okay. Um, and you rode with her. Yes. Um, Where'd you guys go for a swim? There's like a little pool up at the Caressa's house. Oh, okay. she's been she's helping cool. me with my, my walking and everything, and they get me there. Okay. Is it indoor or outdoor? Outdoor. It must have been nice with how hot it has been. Yeah, they, they got something fancy to heat it from the sun. Okay. But that was the three of us. Yeah. Then we went back to around six, no, later. Maybe seven. We went back to Kat's apartment, dropped off Rose, got Kat's dirty, or wet clothes. She had wet clothes, because she was going to dry them. And we went to my house together. Um, And then we go to dance. Okay. um, For the fireworks. He asked us to come by 8.30. some reason I, I was trying to leave, but I was making a, a joke about it that we're we're gonna be late, like stuff like that, goofy crap. 
Uh, I drove to Dan's. Okay. Which car were you going to do? My dad's Subaru. It was okay. a blue. The one in the garage. Yeah. Gotcha. Then we get there. We stay for 45 to an hour. That's how I got the bottle rocket marks. Show me those again. That. Oh, the sparks. Right, you said and I think this was something. a wad or something that oh, flew back. Shot back out of it. Holderson appears relaxed at this point in the interview. The officers have him where they want him. He is asked to show some wounds he got from some 4th of July fireworks. The officers press further with the one sitting to Holderson's right and who had not been partaking so far chiming in. Yeah, that one stuck in for a little bit. That's why it's so bad, but these are sparks. Okay. Those are at Dan's house you got those? Dan's. At Dan's. I, I didn't know the stick. You, you, were, you don't hold yeah. the stick. The stick <laughs> flies with it. Oh, sure. <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> After that, we cleaned. I gave him a bottle of wine as a thank you for letting us come. I, uh, thankfully, I still have a couple bottles at home. But there there we are. And then then someone in the distance, kind of closer to our house, launched a, a mortar artillery firework. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, okay, we have to go home for the dogs. So we went. And that was pushing 9.30, 9.45. We got home. And we get to bed upstairs in my room. Uh, because she doesn't like the couch, it's, and she had work in the morning. Yeah. Then it's Monday morning. Cat goes to work. Seven fifty, ish, or maybe earlier. Then I'm left to myself. So we put on new girl in the couch for it on Monday morning. Mm -hmm. I go back and forth through some video games and then back and video games. Some girl video games. This is Monday. Um, we're getting later. I have a little bit to eat for lunch. I, well, at the end of the day on Monday, I did go, for the afternoon, I did go to the farm to talk to Cress and Kat's mom. I told them what's happening with my health. I think Kat's mom is alright with me. She's, I don't know, she wants me to move into her, the east side. Cat's house okay. and start paying rent as an apartment because she doesn't like to live at home. Does Cat live with their mom or? Cat has an apartment. Okay. Somewhere. So I'm there talking to their mom and Chris. Then I um, then I go up to have you know break down by the shed and they go swimming. Um. Right by the swimming pool is the shed, so they they wanted to watch me, like, you know, break down and all that. So after I noticed they're just watching, I, I just walk over to them. Describe your breakdown to me. Uh, I actually cried. <laughs> As he describes his breakdown, Holderson smiles widely, almost as if he were proud of the reaction he had, and of actually crying. Started kicking grass, just doing the toddler tantrum shit. Um, then I hopped in the water with them. Okay. So it was uh, too late. I was in the water, and I realized Crest didn't have a top, okay. uh, and that was uncomfortable. But I talked to them more, and that's when she brought up the housing situation, how she doesn't like how my parents, like, are. So they're offering me to get a job, live with them, work for them while I'm working. 
and pay rent. And that's kind of their, their deal. I would have like a month free of rent, or a month or two maybe. If... When asked what he had a breakdown about, Halderson looks up at the detective. Notice the change in his facial expression, from the previously furrowed brows and tensed jaw, to looking up, smiling sarcastically and talking back at the officer. At this point, we are seeing a new side to Halderson. What were you having a breakdown about? You ever have your legs <laughs> yeah. No, I haven't. Yeah. Just... I don't even know if they're done getting like as bad as they they can be yet. So yeah. that's a uh, that's not fun. And you, I think you were telling me last night it was it's, it's a symptom of a concussion, right? So that right? that's not it. That's a, it's a symptom of nerve damage from the hit oh, to my spine. So okay. it's permanent. Okay, I understand that now better. Yeah. Um, so it's just legs. I think it's about waist feeling is probably colostomy bag down the road all of that, but here we are Sunday. Yeah. Oh, okay, we're sitting in the pool, we're hanging out. Um, they're just talking to me. Sometimes they're being nice, sometimes they're like making the offer, like, hey, if you move in, you can pay rent. This is a good neighborhood, kind of like the one by my parents. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I live there, I at least be on doing my own thing. And then they're like, well, appreciate you stopping by. So I, I, I head out and I go, it was Monday afternoon, I go to dinner at Cat, Cat's house on the east side. Okay. I think we just eat and cuddle a little bit. Okay. And I go home. And there's the girls, um, let them out and go to bed because I kind of had a day. Yeah. What time do you think you left her place? I'd Cat's say place. nine. You left about nine, okay. Tuesday, Tuesday morning. It was just. I can't remember Tuesday. Um, oh, Dan wakes me up, I believe, with something, or not wakes me up, I, I did the six again with the dogs and the food, but I got back in bed. I don't know if I passed out or zoned out a little bit, but... The closer Halderson's timeline gets to the moment of the interview, the less detailed it becomes. His first description of the Wednesday prior to his parents' disappearance is much more detailed, and scripted, than days in his more recent past. He bows his head down, resting his chin on his hands as he attempts to fill in the time gaps left by his crime. These gaps and his frustration with filling them are a vulnerability, a visible one which can be noticed in Halderson hiding his face away from the officers. Dan is worried about my mom on Tuesday, I think. Did you call I said no, her? no word, my ma. I don't know if he called or texted. Oh, I, no. I think he just contacted. That's what I can think of. Reached out. Yeah. yeah, he reached out. Then I'm like, oh, it's Tuesday morning. They should be here. Um, no word. I think I called my mom that day. All right. And then he talked her. No, she never picked up. It's always either. It's always the, the the voicemail and say voicemail. You know when you oh, yeah. yeah. So it's off out of range. I don't know the other factors that could give you that. It's like a voicemail right away. It goes right to voicemail, right? Yeah. Okay. So whatever factors can give you that. So I might have missed that. So from the time like they left, did you talk to them at all when they were I got a up text. North? You got the one text. Yeah, and I that you mentioned earlier. Don't even like it, right? Yeah. But it's, that was it? Nothing else? Yeah. So that's that's fishy to me, even the text, because I realized Memorial Day is when the White Lake Parade is. Oh, sure. There's no 4th of July. Maybe there's cheap drinks, but there's no parade on okay. White Lake on the 4th. So, so basically, from the time that they're gone at the cabin in your home, 
you know, running around doing what you're doing. You just said one communication with mom. Yeah, that's kind of how I just assumed the amount of people, the, where they're at, and whether sure. they're all. Well, I understand. I'm just, I'm just making sure it wasn't more than one. Her not contacting, but this was the only text. Was there anything with dad? No, I, I wouldn't even bother talking to him. He, he wouldn't use his phone while he's up there. He loves it. Oh, do that. But, you know, does he keep his phone on him when he's up there? Oh. It's, oh. Probably, it's usually in the car. Oh, okay. Um, my brother and I just text all the time while we're up there. We even set up wire antennas sometimes to make make better connection. Sure. Um, okay. So here we are. Where? Tuesday. Um, called mom. Voicemail immediately. Voicemail immediately Tuesday. -ish. Where? Dan. Dan called, worried about mom not coming to work. Um, you had already fed the dogs and that before Dan called it. Or, reached out to uh -huh. right. So, please, I'm doing this kind of thing. I got a coffee at a quick trip one day. Well, I think that could have been Tuesday morning. Okay. A quick trip, I got a coffee. And I, um, I used my dad's number at a quick trip to get me the free one. Because it was the Cruz of Gold. Yeah. I, I, could have, I could have afforded it, but, you know, there's a free one. And it's Tuesday, or it wasn't Monday, I could have gotten a dollar one. But it was full price, I believe, and I, I grabbed the, the coffee because it was a free one. He hasn't used it for weeks, so... I'll grab that. Had a quick trip. I couldn't tell you which one. I was just driving at that point. Um, it was terrible. Oh, it was. I, yeah, I wanted to try Karuba Gold. Yeah. It was wasn't bad. Um, then we're at Tuesday. Uh, cats working up. And I'm gaming job hunt. And then I um, then I started trying to get the the glass. So I've been a little lazy on the glass. I just kind of had chairs in front of it. I had broom and, you know, a little sweeper holder. You know, you broom it into that. Dustpan. Yeah. And I'm tossing the glass into recycling. Okay. And just, um, my blood was kind of on the floor, so I got the Swiffer I borrowed from Cat from the, the foot. I borrowed a Swiffer to mop. I Swiffered the, the floor floor, like not the stone, but the floor. And then I got a little bit in the kitchen. And then everywhere kind of I walked, pretty much. The, the bathroom, the kitchen, and then I, I couldn't get the carpet, so I still stained that up a little crappy. Where was there a carpet at? The kind stairs of? between basement and kitchen. Carpet. Oh, that's right. Carpet stairs. Um, I tried. I can't get it out. As Halderson goes back to talking about an event he had likely scripted, in this case the reason for the bloodstains on his floor, we notice his more relaxed persona return. The contrast between his speech now and his complete silence only minutes before is stark, to say the least. Um, then all the way up to my the laundry room where I found my first aid kit. And I just tried to stop all the bleeding, but I, you know, it wouldn't stop. Mm -hmm. So and that blood was all coming from your left foot. Yeah, left foot hole. Left foot hole. Yeah. I mean, we're talking, are we talking massive amounts of blood? Are we talking, you know, a little bit, like, describe? Um, it started as drops until I got to the bathroom. And then I got back to go grab my sock and some of the, the paper towel. And then I see the glasses in there, so I grab a tweezer and I pull it out. And then it starts squirting out. And I, I got some, oh, no, a little bit of the rock. It wasn't that bad of the rock. But it, um, I think the worst was the, 
that floor that like it kind of like you know like this lid puddles mm -hmm. it was wasn't good. Are we talking the floor down in the basement? Well, that one, um, and then I go upstairs to the kitchen, and it's still going, and I'm trying to get my foot in the sink just to slow it down and pinch it, maybe. Um, and then I waddle upstairs to the, the, the eye factor, the uh, first aid first kit, aid kit yeah. and um, once I got it kind of bundled up, that's it stopped for, for what I know. Then I go, I need to get some tape. Um, we have a tape box in the basement, I go there and I, I opened it up again. And I bled a little bit more, but the basement was easy to clean, it's just cement. Mm -hmm. A little bit of water, and I rigged that up. But then I grabbed the tape box and I wrapped it. Um, after that, that was that's Tuesday. Yep. Where are we? Wednesday morning. Uh, Jane sends you a picture of the cabin. Then I go to the police station because I ask her when should I make a thing a uh, point or the. Uh, I'm sorry. No worries, man. What? Wednesday morning, you said you went to the police department. Yeah, to make a. I still think of that. I'll talk to him about my parents. And then that night, that. What, what night are we on? Wednesday. Wednesday night. I um, go to Dan and Mary's. Wednesday night. Wednesday night. What time do you think? They feed me, um, I had probably 7, 7.30. So you said you went to the, the police department to talk about your parents. What? Just tell me, what exactly did you talk about your parents, what the deputies about? Oh, we're making a report. A uh, report that I thought I had to do that at a, at a station. Okay. And you were reporting... Like, what were you reporting exactly? Just, I just want to write down and yeah. have it on there. Uh, I've, they're missing this. Okay. They're missing this. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, I'll just kind of look at some things here. So we started Wednesday. Um, Mom had work. You and your dad watched Wheel of Fortune. I'm just going to kind of read stuff back through a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Um, and we kind of ended it last night because that's, I've been talking to you since then, you know, so I don't think there's much else that I need you to tell me from last night. Um, so watching Wheel of Fortune, uh, you're on the couch, table downstairs, or couch back to the table downstairs, and I tossed him the, the ball around for the dog and broke the last fireplace. Um, your foot gets hurt, dad gets mad. Right? Yeah. Mom left for work in the morning, comes home later on. Um, dog was fine, not injured at all. Was it the dog or the ball that crashed into the glass? Both. The ball bounced it, but the, the dog hit it with the shoulder. Okay. That's how it broke. It, it went to, the ball went to done it. Yeah, probably not. Okay. Um, all right. Um, playing games, watching YouTube, job search. I'm just going to... Instead of reading out loud, I'll just make sure I don't have any questions. Um, you guys typically make your beds every day? Look like they were made yesterday when I was there. Yes. Okay. We usually do sheets every few days in beds. As far as the blood on your foot, um, how did you clean that up? So we we were talking. You got you had blood on Swiffer wet jet. Okay, Swiffer wet jet. And where did you get that from? Can't let me borrow it. Um, Where's it at now? I returned it to Kat. Yeah. Okay. I don't know where it's at now. Did you use anything else? Hydrogen peroxide for the, the tiles and the hard floors. Um, just the big globs needed a little bit. Hydrogen peroxide. Did that seem to help get rid of the blood? Well, it hurt my foot. 
uh, that stuff. Um, but it didn't really help. Okay. It kind of just made a mess. And when you say only on tiles, I'm trying to remember your house. I couldn't do carpet with it. It yeah. would ruin the carpet, right? It would. I think so. Um, um, tiles, are we talking kitchen? Because downstairs yeah. is just like cement. Well, when I had some blood on the basement, I used the peroxide. Okay. Basement floor. And tiles in the kitchen? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I peroxided. There it wasn't as much. Like, there were... Like this size pools in the kitchen. Okay. I was pinching it pretty dang hard, but which was also cutting deeper because yeah. I had another or might still have another piece of glass. Is so that the biggest pool that you saw was something? this was downstairs. Okay. This was kind of on the stone, close to the glass, and then there was one right at the base, kind of where the chairs I put, like a good, like. Two three inch diameter. Two three inch diameter. Okay. Um, more than that. Um, Did you do anything to? So I wrote down on Tuesday that you tried getting the glass cleaned up in the basement, um, tossed it in the glass receptor, glass and recycling. Did you clean up at all when it actually happened? No, my dad was furious. So, uh, so he he did stuff to clean it. Yeah, I don't know what he did, but I he sent me to my room upstairs. And he did whatever he did, but it still was on the floor after he was done. Okay. Did your dad get injured at all when the glass broke? Did he step on any or? He sent me up, but I, I don't doubt it. If he gets mad, he's not thinking. So uh, we don't know if your dad got hurt. No. Okay. No. But my best guess is that guy reached in the fireplace and cut off his arm or something. I don't know. Is there any reason to believe mom or dad's blood would be somewhere in the house? Hulderson plays off this question well. The officer had obviously asked it with the intent of raising his anxiety, and whilst we can still see the classic signs of dishonesty in Hulderson, such as his avoidance of eye contact, his tone of voice is relaxed. Hulderson's attitude tells the officers that they have good rapport with him, but the iron needs to strike while it's hot. Have they been injured at all that you're aware of? Well, my dad scratches his psoriasis till he, like, gushes blood. Okay, gushing, um, describe gushing to me. Enough to run down your leg, like, um, like cover your leg, I suppose, like, he has it on his knee. So when he does this, it just, like, drips nice. down. Uh, and I ask him to stop, but he doesn't do it when he's stressed out. Yeah. He, he just kind of, like, it's his tick. He's just, yeah, probably itches. Does he, um... Yeah, like, does it enough to get on the floor? Does it leave? Oh, yeah. yeah. Like, how much, like, before we were talking the water bottle lid and the Yeti lid, is there, I mean, like, are we talking puddles like that, or just no. bins, or? It could be enough. Okay. But I'm thinking Yeti lid, if he's there, and I don't catch him soon enough. Oh, jeez. My ma's blood, um, just from her bloody nose that she gets sometimes when she wakes up. Uh, that's why we've been doing uh, the dehumidifier, or humidifier and dehumidifiers. Yeah. Probably downstairs you get the we ha We have to do multiple of them, but she can't be in the living room too long because that's a dehumidifier. Yeah. And if she does, she, her nose gets bad. Not like a regular one, she gets it bad. Um, but... She either goes to the kitchen to fix it, her vanity, or the bathroom. Um, when she has bloody noses, are we talking? It's just spraying around. Is it just dripping? Well, it's not is squirting, it, but it's just dripping, and she doesn't notice it. Okay. Because she can't feel it anymore. Okay. Um, is there any reason to believe that in either one of their vehicles there would be any of their blood? Their vehicles? Yeah. Or anybody's vehicle, let's say that. No, um, maybe car trash. Mom's car trash would definitely, the past few days. My dad's car trash. 
Why would, why would they have blood in their car crashes? Well, my mom does the bloody noses with the air conditioning. So, oh, okay. in the would we have air conditioning? My mom will will have to use um, uh, bring towels and stuff yeah. because in the hot days you can't have your windows open. You'll you won't drive well. Yeah. So air conditioning. My mom will have nosebleeds. Um, my dad hasn't had them as much as she does, but he gets them. Um, his are worse than my ma's. Does but, he ever get them in the house then, or? Um, mostly just with air conditioning, okay. or sometimes, sometimes with a dehumidifier. Okay. Me, personally, just in air conditioning. Mm -hmm. I get them, but I'm not as bad as my parents. I, it's, um, not bad. Okay. As far as up at the cabin, when do you think the last time you were up there? Personally, last year. Last year. Memorial Day, I believe. I think it wasn't the weekend before Memorial. I didn't make the parade. I never got to go last year. When do you think the last time your mom or dad were at the cabin before? My dad went when my brother was diagnosed with diabetes. When was that? The weekend before my concussion, so one, two, three, well, not including this week, three, four, yeah, four. Did Mitch go up there with him? When no, you know, well, my mom and I were kind of with Mitch all that weekend okay, doing so stuff. Dad just went to Wallow. Yep, and then later that week I had my fall, and I I've just started getting my memory back. Okay. So, <laughs> where did his mom been up there this year at all? Mom has not been up there this year. Okay. Maybe they were up there before. Uh, no, I think Dad, Dad did it all himself. Maybe. Okay. I think this is first. And Mitch hasn't been in the cabin in a while, right? Today. Oh, well, other than today. Yeah, I, I couldn't say he's been there. He didn't go last year. Okay. okay. Does he kind of do his own thing, or? Um, Mitch hasn't lived with us, or, you know, like, he's got a family now, a dog oh, or girlfriend, no kids, but, cool. He's kind of, you know, uh, opposite side of town. You know how it is yeah. with brothers. Yeah, oh, yeah. He's flew the coop. Kind of. <laughs> got a few of myself. Yeah. Alright. I've started thinking about that myself, and my parents are trying to figure that out with me. Mm -hmm. The other officer intervenes, an unfamiliar voice to Holderson. This combined with the officer's accusatory remarks send Holderson into a panic. His head turns from one officer to the other as he starts realizing their play on him, and his anxious facial expression complete with sweaty palms, has returned. Okay. So we have like 20 pages of writing. We're going to start with a clean, white piece of paper for you to start telling the truth. Okay. What? Because listen, listen to me. This is the only chance you're going to have to tell us the truth. Okay. Okay. What we, listen, listen. I'm, I can't tell you what we know, but we know you're not telling us the truth. We know your parents are no longer with us. Okay. And we know the reason why. Okay, you need to tell the truth. There's... Listen, listen. As the second officer approaches Holderson, whose guilty head lies low like a terrified child's, we ought to notice his lack of reaction to the officers revealing that they know of his parents' deaths. Holderson's breath quickens, and his head is now fogged by panic. The perfect mix for the officers to keep mounting the pressure onto him and hopefully squeeze out a confession. You need to tell the truth about what happened, and just tell us why it happened. Okay. If something happened, if you were defending yourself, or if you just got fed up with stuff, you need to tell us the truth. Okay? This is your chance to tell us why. Okay? I'm not BSing you. Okay? So can we do that? Okay. They're okay. Um... 
Alderson turns his head away from the second officer, pointing it towards the one he had built rapport with, and shortly realizing that neither are actually on his team. I'm sorry. Say it in your channel. Lawyer. Okay. Because they're... Okay. Do you want a lawyer? Yeah. Okay. 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 Right down the timing there, it's about 6.41. You're under Okay. Alderson's expression denotes a feeling of betrayal. He asks the officer to his left. Okay. What happened? Okay, can... You know what happened. We're not going to tell you what happened. You know what happened. You were there when it happened. Once again, his personas have switched. A minute before this interaction, when Holderson was just being told he is under arrest, his attitude and body language were markedly different. He covers his head as the officer answers, before immediately letting go, realizing that his movements could be interpreted as fearful or anxious. We're not BSing you, okay? I wasn't there when it We know more right. than you think we know. Okay. Okay. There's people that have told us things. We have we have evidence. We have proof that more has happened. Okay. So your parents never made it to the cabin, and I think you know that. On July second, after Krista didn't come in to work, a couple of her co-workers stopped by the Holderson home to check in on her. They were greeted by a Chandler who had a bandage on his left foot, which he had cut on glass from the fireplace. His cut, Chandler said, was the reason there was blood everywhere in the house. On July 4th, Halderson sent a text from his mother's phone to his own. His story was that his parents had been picked up for a 4th of July weekend by an unknown couple, and that they were going to be at their family's cabin. He reported them as missing to the police on the 7th of July. Police caught on to the fact that something was off when they read the text Halderson's mother had supposedly sent him, which mentioned that they would be staying at the cabin for longer as they were going to see the White Lake 4th of July parade. There was no parade held in White Lake on that day. On July 5th, Chandler was seen around a Forstead area by his girlfriend's mother. He had asked her if he could come around and use the pool. She mentioned that she was not going to be home, but that he is welcome to use their amenities. When she came back, the pool cover was still on. Halderson's car, she said, was parked next to a forested area close to her home with the trunk open. Halderson came back a few moments later and appeared flustered. He then jumped in the pool, but only shortly. Vultures started frequenting the area on July 8th, and on the 14th of July, Bart Halderson's disembodied torso was found in the exact area that Chandler had been seen. After police filed two missing persons report on the 7th of July, the first missing link they encounter are the Halderson's cars, which had been left untouched in their garage. Authorities in northern Wisconsin investigate the Halderson cabin, which they conclude had also been left untouched for a considerable amount of time. Neighbors in the area had also not seen anyone recently. On July 13th, a shell casing is found inside the Halderson home. The casing is consistent with an SKS rifle, which Halderson was in possession of at the time of the murders. As Bart's remains are discovered and identified, Chandler is arrested and charged with the murder of his father. But Krista still remained to be found. On the 30th of July, human remains, which had been found in a pond nearby the Wisconsin River, are identified as Krista's and Chandler is now formally charged with the heinous murder of both his parents. Unbeknownst to Chandler, there was evidence which placed him where he had dumped his mother's remains. 
His girlfriend, whom he had told he was busy with chores, became suspicious and took a screenshot of Chandler's snap map's location. He was near the Wisconsin River. After lying to the police for almost two hours and finally being charged with the murder of both his parents, Holderson's trial in March 2022 resulted in life sentencing without the possibility of parole. Holderson was found guilty on two counts of first-degree intentional homicide, mutilating a corpse, hiding a corpse, and providing false information about a missing person. What is left behind is a broken, devastated family home and the memories of what might have seemed like a normal family. No one knew, and no one could have known what a scrawny-looking, unambitious son like Chandler Holderson could be capable of. These faces, they're some of the more than 40 college-age men who mysteriously drowned the tragedy spanning 25 cities and 11 states. Two former NYPD police officers there say that they are all murder victims linked to what they call the smiley face killings. What do you see here? What I see is uh, a circle, two eyes, a nose, no mouth, but it clearly represents a smiley face. They were all young, popular, athletic, and academic achievers. They had plans for their bright future and were deprived of the future, which seemed quite promising. Hi everyone, in this video, we will review the story of the drowning deaths of college-aged men across America and what further was proposed as the smiley face murder theory by detectives Kevin Gannon and Anthony Duarte, as well as Dr. Lee Gilbertson. Was it accident or murder? Alcohol or serial killers? We don't know. So, join me. Maybe together we find some new clues because the mystery is still unsolved. For Kevin Gannon, a detective in New York City, it all started in February 16, 1997, when he was investigating the disappearance of Patrick McNeil, 20, who vanished after a night out with friends at a bar in Manhattan's Upper East Side. His body was found two months later floating near a pier in the East River. The death was ruled as an accident. Believing that foul play was involved, Gannon promised McNeil's devastated family that he wouldn't stop until he found out who killed their son. Over the next 15 months, two more men around the same age disappeared in New York City. The body of one of them was found near where McNeil's body was found, while the other was discovered in the Hudson River around 138th Street. Before going any further, let's have a look at Detective Gannon's background. In other words, man number one in suggesting the smiley face murder theory. Kevin Gannon was working as a sergeant in the Detective Bureau from the New York City Police Department, or NYPD, and retired in 2001 after 20 years of service, which included more than 14 years as a supervisor. He is highly experienced in personal and physical security, investigation and surveillance, and disaster response. Gannon was awarded almost 100 medals for bravery. Not only has he supervised plainclothes personnel in anti-crime, narcotics, and robbery units, but also was second in charge of the NYPD's missing person squad, as well as in charge of the Bronx Homicide Task Force, from 1999 until his retirement in 2001. After retiring from the NYPD, Gannon teamed up with his old partners, Anthony Duarte and Mike Donovan in 2005 to discover what had happened to McNeil as well as other young men who died under similar circumstances. Gannon even went further and mortgaged his own house 
and maxed out his credit cards to help fund the investigation. The following year, after watching a report on CNN about similar suspicious drownings in the Midwest and looking into them, Gannon and his team were joined by Dr. Lee Gilbertson, a criminal justice professor and gang expert at a university in Minnesota who had been studying the Midwest drownings for years. Gannon's investigations agency, GD Investigations, was officially established in 2007. In 2006, the team started traveling to all of the sites where the victims were found and could discover similarly smiley faces graffiti, nine of them drawn with horns, either where the men were put in the water or where they were found. Actually, many were seen on bridges, but unfortunately it was too late to check the New York City cases or the earlier ones in the Midwest. Between 1997 and 2008, Authorities pulled the dead bodies of more than 40 young white men out of rivers and lakes in more than 25 cities across 11 states, with police consistently theorizing that the men had grown too drunk, gotten too close to the water, fallen in, and could not get out in their intoxicated state. In 2008, Gannon, Duart, and Gilbertson announced their findings to the public as the smiley face murder theory, bringing forth evidence of over 40 potential victims. They have theorized that the young men found dead in bodies of water across several Midwestern American states from the late 90s to the 2010s did not accidentally drown but were all murdered, either by an individual or by an organized group of serial killers. The term smiley face became connected to the alleged murders when it was made public that Gannon and Duart had discovered graffiti depicting a smiley face near locations where they think the murder had dumped the bodies in at least a dozen of the cases. Furthermore, they suggested that this smiley face murderer may have been motivated to kill out of envy. In 2008, Gannon said to the Daily Beast, to me, this is one of the most dangerous domestic groups in the United States, and somebody needs to pay attention to them. The level of sophistication of the group is a lot greater than we'd imagined. Now we know they communicate with each other on the dark web. We know their surveillance and counter-surveillance. On the other hand, the same year the FBI issued a press release claiming that they have not developed any evidence to support links between these tragic deaths or any evidence substantiating the theory that these deaths were the work of a serial killer or killers, and they related the vast majority of these instances to probable drowning due to alcohol intoxication. A document called Drowning the Smiley Face Murder Theory, released in 2010 by the Center of Homicide Research, outlines 18 reasons for the falsehood of the theory, including lack of evidence of victim trauma, lack of exact match among smiley faces, and lack of evidence relating the drownings to a serial killer motive. In 2013, ABC7 in Chicago reported that since 1997, the number of mysteriously drowned college-aged men whose bodies have been found in clusters around the country had reached 200. All victims shared a strange similarity. Caucasian male, 18 to 26 years old, good-looking, athletic, and very intelligent. Their bodies were found in a river, pond, lake, or stream after a night out drinking. All these cases have been individually classified as accidental or undetermined and have not been investigated as possibly related crimes. However, by 2020, there were over 300 cases in Gannon's team database. Now it's time to review what happened to some of the victims of drowning cases. The list is extensive. That's why we will go through only some of them. Believe me, the issue is darker than it sounds. Patrick McNeil. The death of Patrick McNeil from New York sparked Gannon's interest in the cases. 20-year-old McNeil was a Fordham accounting major. 
He vanished on February 16, 1997, after drinking with friends at Dapper Dog Bar on Manhattan's Upper East Side. His body was dragged out of the East River on April 7, 1997, 12 miles away. He was found floating in the water face up, which is extremely rare for drowning victims, and an autopsy revealed ligature marks around his neck. According to evidences, McNeil was dead before he ever hit the water, and the absence of what's known as skin slippage under his feet indicated he'd been in the water for less than a day, although being disappeared for two months. The cause of McNeil's death was ruled a drowning, but the manor was undetermined. However, Gannon's investigation pointed toward murder, Witnesses told him a car with a man and a woman was double-parked outside the bar when McNeil emerged and followed him. As Gannon later said, he had walked the whole area and could hardly find any access to the river. Gannon promised McNeil's parents he would never give up and would get justice for their son. Anthony Skifton 19-year-old Skifton was studying at University of Wisconsin, La Crosse. He was last seen by friends on October 10, 97 at 2.30 a.m. while leaving a party at a bar. His body was found 10 days later in Ile La Plume Slough, an offshoot of the Mississippi River. According to the autopsy report, acute alcohol intoxication was the contributing factor in the death cause of death ruling was drowning by accident. However, according to his family, Skifton could not swim and was scared to death of water. Ryan Getz Getz, 21 years old, was a mechanical engineering student at Kettering University in Michigan. He disappeared on December 31, 1997, after celebrating New Year's Eve with friends. He left his friends to drop by his girlfriend's apartment to see if she had left yet. Since she was not home, Getz asked her neighbors to call her apartment. However, they were the last ones to see Getz and later told the police that he was very drunk and a stranger was with him that they believed Getz followed the unidentified person into another apartment. His body was found three and a half months later trapped on a fallen tree in the Red Cedar River cause of death ruling was drowning. There was some indication that he might have been involved in a fight. Keith Noble Keith Noble, 19, was a student at Ohio University in Athens, Ohio. He was last seen on April 25, 1998 at 1.10 a.m. while leaving a party near the west side of campus in Athens, Ohio. His body was found 11 days later in the Hocking River 200 yards south of the White Mill Dam near the west side of campus. Cause of death ruling was drowning, intoxication with no indication of physical violence. Jeffrey Giese Jeffrey Giese, 21, was a University of Wisconsin La Crosse mechanical engineering major. He vanished on April 11, 1999, after a night of partying with friends at Club Millennium La Crosse, Wisconsin. His body was found the following month in the Mississippi River by fishermen. According to the autopsy report, the cause of death was probably drowning. On the other hand, based on four shallow self-inflicted scars on his arms, authorities suspected it could have been suicide. However, his father, Richard Giese, believed the alcohol-related deaths might be related, and he suspected someone might be pushing drunken young men into the Mississippi. Brian Weltson Brian Weltson, 21, was a student of finance with a 3.8 GPA at Northern Illinois University in DeKalb, Illinois. He went missing during the early morning hours of New Year's Day 2000, after celebrating New Year's at Irish Eyes Pub with his friends. After returning back to the Ambassador East Hotel in Chicago, where they were sharing a room, his friends went up to the room leaving Weltson behind near the hotel entrance, and then he vanished. 
Waltzen's body was not found until 77 days later on a beach in Gary, Indiana. According to police, Waltzen must have been intoxicated and fallen into Lake Michigan, drowned and his body then traveled around 30 miles from there over the two and a half months he was missing. His death was ruled as an undetermined drowning. However, despite his body supposedly being in the water for 77 days, his autopsy report only indicated the minimal decomposition, with no fluid in the lungs and no sand found in the stomach. This evidence shows that Weltson did not drown and was most likely dead upon entering the water. According to Dr. Gilbertson estimation, Weltson had only been dead 36 hours before his body was discovered. Christopher Jenkins Christopher Jenkins, 21, was a University of Minnesota marketing and entrepreneurial management major. He was a star athlete, a two-time team captain of his lacrosse team, who was set to graduate with stellar grades from the university's prestigious Carlson School of Management. He was last seen on October 31, 2002, after being kicked out of Lone Tree Bar and Grill in downtown Minneapolis, where he was partying with his friends. Four months later, his body was found encased in ice in the Mississippi River, face up with his arms crossed across his chest. Although Jenkins' death was initially classified as an accidental drowning, police later agreed to change it to homicide in 2006 after four years of exhaustive efforts by his parents. His family has said that they have various reasons to believe he was thrown in the back of a van, abducted, tortured, and eventually murdered. Paul Kochu Paul Kochu, 22, was an athletic young man, graduated from Pittsburgh's Donetsk University and working as a nurse at Algany General Hospital. He went missing in the early morning hours of December 16, 2014. After drinking at a bar and watching Monday Night Football, he left his friends and went home, where he accidentally cut his hand. His roommates came home to help clean that up. Kochu was last seen at 1.30 a.m. after his friends left to get food. Ten days after, police released surveillance footage that captured Kochu at 2.45 a.m., heading in the direction of the 10th Street Bridge, which crosses the Monongalea River in downtown Pittsburgh. Three months later, Kochu's body was found floating in the Ohio River near Wheeling, West Virginia, with a small cut on his hand, three broken ribs, and a one-inch wound on his scalp. The cause of death was officially ruled as undetermined drowning. However, Kochu's parents have long voiced their suspicions that foul play was involved in their son's death. Dakota James Dakota James, a 23-year-old graduate student at Donetsk University, who was working full-time while getting his MBA, vanished on January 25, 2017 after a night out with friends at a bar on Liberty Avenue in downtown Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and heading for home on the north side. The last known picture of him alive was caught on a surveillance camera which showed James entering a dark alley. His body was discovered 40 days later, floating in the Ohio River, about 10 miles from where he was last seen in downtown Pittsburgh. James's death was listed as an accidental drowning. However, as Gannon said, there is no way a body could travel 10 miles through a dam, 40 days, and be that pristine. It's impossible. In December 2018, Gannon and Cyril Vecht, a forensic pathologist, reported that based on an independent examination on James's autopsy photos, he might have been strangled due to ligature marks on the back furrow of the neck. Gannon believes that James was then drugged with GHB, abducted, held for some time, killed and dumped in a body of water. Pam James said her family won't give up until they know exactly what happened to Dakota. I don't want my son's name going down in history as that drunk kid 
who walked down the alley and walked across that river and drowned because he didn't do it. You will certainly agree that the most heartbreaking point is having no accurate answer to a terrific question blowing the mind. What really happened to these young men? Gannon and his team have developed additional physical evidence and expanded their database of potential victims of the Smiley Face Killers to 335 cases of suspicious drownings and emphasized the presence of evidence related to lividity, insect presence, GHB traces, decomposition rates, and the presence of Smiley Face graffiti. After all these years, Gannon hasn't forgotten his promise to McNeil's mother, Jackie who is still holding out hope she will finally get some answers. As she said, I want to know what happened to Patrick. I need to know what happened to Patrick and I want to know who's responsible. It's hard living every day not knowing. If this bizarre story captivated your attention, don't forget to like the video. Leave your comments down below and subscribe to the channel. Meanwhile, by hitting the notification bell, you can stay up to date each time we upload a new mysterious case. Please, don't forget to share this video with your family and friends. Until next time, stay safe. We will be with you soon again with another shocking case.